Happy Mushoku Mondays, everybody. Welcome back to yet another trek through Mushoku Tensei Jobless Reincarnation novel series. We are on volume 15, chapter 2. <laughs> Much apologies for last week. I, I recorded chapter 1 and 2, but with everything going on, I got super swamped and I could only manage to get out chapter 1 for everybody, which was a massive disappointment. Everybody's like, literally, Diary 1 and Diary 2 go together. And it's like, well, technically all the chapters go together, so I have to stop somewhere. <laughs> But it was just a lot of struggles that I was having last week, so I just wanted to get something out for everybody. And it was a meaty episode. It was a it was a nice hour and hour, almost hour and a half episode. So I think we got plenty out there. But yes, uh, thank you to all the Silphy fans who are still around. <laughs> Made Silphy fans angry again. Honestly, the chat kind of went wild because it was like I was trying to be very in the middle. Like I understand every side of it, and yes, I understand the idea that Rudius draws negative conclusions a lot. Uh, but yeah, I was hearing like, oh yeah, that's right, Lucy. She, Lucy got left behind too. But I assume that she had Lilia take care of Lucy, and she was gonna come back. I, I fully, I fully accept that. But there's there's a side of there, but that's like, yeah, it was crazy that she left. But again, I'm not gonna get back into that. And thankfully, in chapter three, we actually get some insight into Sylphie, which I think is fantastic. I always love finally getting in her mind again. But yeah, I pre-recorded chapter two, so we're going to do a little bit of a time jump going back for me recording chapter two with no context of three, by the way, which yes, three gets into some crazy stuff. So just to get you guys a little heads up there that we're going to we're going to jump around a little bit. But as per usual, thanks to everybody that dropped by for the premiere. Hey, chat. Hope you guys are doing well. Uh, thanks, as usual, for everybody's support, either by kind words or just those that support monetarily. Let's keep this going. Uh, it's you guys that keeps the lights on. It keeps me doing this stuff, and I really greatly appreciate it, but yes, with all that said, let's jump into chapter two and do a quick little time jump. <laughs> chapter two, the diary, part two. The next morning, he reopened the diary, picked up where he left off. However, it seemed like the old man hadn't wrote anything for some time after Sylphie's death. Turning the page, he found a paper was noticeably different. It seemed a year or two had passed, at least. Maybe more. The entries were vague enough that it could have been a decade. He had no way of knowing what happened in that gap. But when the entries resumed, Rudius was surprised by how stupid and juvenile they seemed. There was a lot of talk about women in the street, size of their butts. One entry recounted his seduction of a waitress at a new tavern. Others described visits to brothels, complete with reviews of their qualities. I wonder if he went back at <laughs> I wonder if he went back to the one in uh what was that uh Bash or whatever? The um Ellis, <laughs> Elise. But I, but it does <laughs> <laughs> but we did, we literally have Rudius's uh, interspecies reviewers arc. They should make an entire segment of novels just based on Rudius doing inter, uh, interspecies reviews, <laughs> checking out all the brothels and and talking about how the different types work and everything and how good they are, and <laughs> rating them. The language got ugly at times. It was a diary of a scumbag, in all honesty. In one entry. He even took time to rank all the women he had slept with. It was hard to believe that it was him writing it. That was that's an interesting thing. Is like before he doesn't question anything, but here is where he starts to question things. And this is like a deeper theory that I have throughout this entire diary. Is this idea that there's a there's a part of me that almost wonders. I understand like the obvious answer here is that Rudius over these many years is just turning in a bad state. Like he is not happy. He's ruined. He's got all this massive regret. People around him are all dead. He, Everybody doesn't want to be around him. He doesn't want to be around anybody else. He's drinking all the times. He's just kind of went into this horrible slump. I mean, he's literally becoming his old self. He's becoming the past life Rudius. He's becoming somebody that doesn't want to connect with anybody. Just wants to be alone. Leave me alone. Just indulge and don't have any responsibilities or anything because everything's destroyed. And additionally, not trusting him. I mean, he gets in that later on, this idea of him over time questioning Edis and who's she working for. It's like that old idea that suddenly he starts suspecting everybody and everybody's dangerous and he's just killing everybody in his way. It's like, there's this part of me that's like, yes, this is a downfall into a horrible state. Anger, hate, just disconnected from life itself, no value to life itself, hating everything. But, it could also, but I also wonder if there's like a possibility that it's similar to the whole situation with Zenith. That when she got placed in that crystal, the mana flowing through it messed up her mind. I have this ongoing theory of the possibility of having so much mana in himself. What if that's affecting his mind? What if it's making him go crazy? But what is it, what is the chances that him having this massive mana pool is a bad thing? I mean, Laplace. Laplace had a massive mana pool. What did Laplace do? 
According to history, which I now question every single bit of it now, <laughs> I even wonder if Laplace was even a bad person. Maybe Laplace, the man I messed up with their mind. Who knows? Was this what he would become without Roxy and Sylvie around? They're like his guidepost. <laughs> he apparently spent years indulging in this lifestyle. It wasn't clear where the events took place, but he recognized some of the names of a few taverns in Shariah, so he was likely living there. It was odd that some names were missing, though. He never mentioned Aisha, Norn, Lilia, Zenith, or Lucy. Every once in a while, there's a reference to Zenoba and Julie. But some of those entries made him queasy. His future self apparently had an eye for Julie at this point. <laughs> Don't touch for Julie. The girl had been his faithful pupil since she was a kid. And now he was looking to take advantage of her. Oof. Ugh. It, and that, that becomes a question mark of how old she is at this point. Um, because again, when he first got Julie, she was six. And... What would be her age at this point? Again, time is skipping, but he's not mentioning what time stamps. He's not he's not putting a date to anything. So we don't really know how, how old she is. And it's great to think that Rudius himself reading about this is queasy. He's He doesn't like the idea that at some point my future self took advantage of her. Because yes, the obvious label that's going to be placed on this is the idea of grooming. Did he groom her to it? And is he taking advantage of that in order to get with her? Doesn't say exactly what he did, but if it's queasy to him, it's obvious that this is something that he's not liking. He didn't want to believe that he was capable of sinking this low. That said, he had to admit that it wasn't implausible. He knows himself. He knows that if I sunk this low, I'd probably do that. It makes perfect sense. I could be that disgusting. In the face of crushing despair, he could imagine abandoning himself to pursue meaningless pleasure, especially since he had the looks and the money to make that lifestyle easy. Ed has popped up somewhat frequently in these entries, his future self doing his best to avoid her. She was living in Shariah as well, and whenever they ran into each other, she'd beat him up and then scowl. <laughs> he wrote, I'd like to catch that girl and teach her a lesson, but I don't want her swearing revenge on me or something. She's already doing it. <laughs> She's literally already doing it. It's probably best to just keep my distance. Rudy's thought, pretty pathetic stuff. Reading between the lines, he got a sense his feelings towards Edis were more complicated than he let on. Was there still a part of him that wanted to patch up the relationship somehow? Here's where... I don't know if I mentioned it earlier. I'm forgetting now when I'm recording things and when I'm not. Um, this is where I'm starting to get this sense here that I liked that I brought that up. I think, it, yes, in the last Michigan Monday, the, for the late parts of 14th volume, the thing that I was bringing up is that I think he needs to read the book before he writes the letter because I think the book is going to make him realize how important she actually is. And it actually ends up happening here. He's actually getting a sense of, wait, I was wrong. Yes, the old man told me I was wrong, but now I'm seeing for myself all the signs, the signs that my future self, as he was living this life, couldn't figure out. Because yes, even his future self, when he was talking to Rudius, said specifically, yes, I couldn't forgive her too. He's admitting, I'm telling you to get over it, but yeah, I, me, you at that time, I would have said the same thing you're saying now. Like he's acknowledging fully I'm telling you something that I know that I myself would not have accepted, but because I had the, because I seen everything else, I know I'm wrong now. And now Ruiz is seeing it here. And I think it's probably because his future self implanted into his head, but it's starting to hit now. After what happened with Sylphie and Roxy, maybe he'd lost the ability to pursue actual romance. It was hard to say for sure, but at the least, the bitter words that he wrote didn't fit cleanly with his actions he was describing. I guess you can say that's the idea of him not wanting to kill her not wanting to make her want to have revenge on him. On another note, there was some disquieting events mixed in with all the debauchery. He and Zenoba had a price in their heads, courtesy of the Mills Church. Sometimes he would have to fend off assassins or bounty hunters. This didn't seem like much of a problem as he was taking them down with ease so far. Knowing what happens later on. <laughs> Oof. Turning the page after one such entry, he found another transition in the contents. Seemingly another skip forward in time. Once again, no summary or the missing years. Now the paper type changed with every page and nothing was dated clearly. So we're jumping a lot. Norn's picture book and the reserved figurines were both selling very well. Cool. At least that, at least something kept going. I think Zenoba was the only thing keeping him going in that, that route. He also convinced the university to officially integrate his silent spellcasting into the curriculum. That's interesting. 
Um, I almost was when I read this part, I was almost thinking that later on with the diary, it was going to like point out that that was a bad idea because now suddenly a lot of people have this and it's turning out to be dangerous. It seemed the holy country sent a demand via the kingdom of Asura to Renoa to hand him over. But as long as the magic nations considered him useful, he didn't see that happening. Interesting. And that makes perfect sense because the magic city Shirai is already doing things the holy country of Mills doesn't want them doing. They're still doing, you know, they're, they're still, you know, conversing and there's still a lot of transactions happening between all these nations, but they're not happy terms. Thanks to the Red War Mountains, it was no easy task to invade a country on the central continent. They put the aggressor at the disadvantage. Also, Osra didn't seem to be aware of the fact that he burnt a decent section of the capital to the ground. There's where it kind of clarifies that, you know, he burned an area to the ground. <laughs> Not just burn the bodies and burn the people that try to stop him. He burned an area to the ground. He knew they were scum, but he supposed that they were also imbeciles as well. The diary continued. Zenobo was very close to completing his automaton now. It took longer than I expected, but we're almost there. I can't feel the excitement I did back when we first started, though. Why am I even doing this? What's the point? Yeah, that's kind of an interesting thing. Like, he's still doing this, but then he doesn't care. I think he's just trying to keep himself busy. Or Zenobo's kind of just pulling something out of him to keep something going. Purpose of some sort. The first automaton was completed. Zenoba made her in Sylvie's image. <laughs> she has no, she has her own will and acted on her own initiative. However, she did anything I tell her without question. She's obedient and meek, but has a bit of a jealous side. She is really the spinning image of the woman I used to know in almost every way. But this wasn't what I wanted. This isn't what I need. I destroyed the Sylvie automaton. That's something that's actually very, uh, <laughs> Significant to these days with the with the advent of AI and people scanning messages and stuff like that of people in order to recreate them in AI. It's it's one of those really sad aspects of like it's them, but it's not them it is not them in the end. And that's a really unsettling thing to even think that Rudeus would. Uh, well, I know Zenoba was doing it for a reason. Zenoba's trying to help him knows that his master's grieving and would assume that he would love something like that. Zenoba would love it like. It's an automaton, but equally, it's an automaton that he loves. Why, why wouldn't Master like this? Um, but still, it's it's very, very unsettling. And yes, I can make jokes about her being an automaton, it being perfectly like her. <laughs> Just kidding. I expected Zenoba would be furious, but he apologized instead. That just made me feel guiltier. I owe that man more than I could ever repay. At the very least, he earned my loyalty until the day I die. Or he dies. He made a new automaton, and it wasn't based off Sylphie or Roxy. And Zenoba gave it the name of 40. Apparently, it was a 40th masterpiece, according to him. We're mass-producing 40's sisters now, and the Magic Nation will be buying them from us. It's nice having countries as your main customers. They've got deep pockets. Not that Rudy's even cares at this point. But again, that, that was... Knowing what kind of happens later on, it's like... It kind of makes you wish that he created, like, a set of them that would protect him. <laughs> I don't know how useful dolls would be in the military capacity. But Zenoba and I refined the design a great deal over the years. I'm guessing they were stronger than your average knight, or adventurer at least. Now that we've reached our goal, it feels like I've run out of things to do. I have to decide what my next project will be. For the first time in a while, I'm actually feeling a little motivated. That's how you know it's going to go downhill. <laughs> it's like he finally he finally has purpose again, and he's like, eh, and then something's going to happen. <sighs> Turning the page, Reese was startled by another shift in tone of the diary. This one sheet of paper was badly wrinkled. He had clearly been crying on the page as he wrote it. The man god showed up in my dreams. I could still feel his hand resting on my shoulder. I hate him. I hate him so much. I have to get more powerful and fast. I needed to kill that bastard. It's my new purpose in life. Until the day he dies, Roxy and her child will never rest in peace. Neither will I, for that matter. That was the visit with the man god right there. Come to think of it. I wonder how Lily and the others are doing. I haven't seen them since they left the house. I wonder how Lucy turned out. I bet she's beautiful. Just like her mom. I hope she's doing well with her studies. I hope she's getting enough to eat. I wish like hell I hadn't fallen apart like that after Sylphie died. Aisha did come back to look after me eventually, but I can't imagine the others have forgiven me. Sending off a letter now wouldn't do any good. I've got so many regrets. Here's where it all hits him. It took him this long, but finally it's hitting him. I screwed up again. Scott, he's, I think it's like that aspect that he does his stuff with Zenoba. They're progressing. And then he has that moment of like finally stopping what he's doing and think about it. Crap. Screwed up. But let's all note, let's all note, everybody left him. 
Silphy left him. Lilia left him. Zenith left him. Zenoba's a good boy. He hasn't technically left him. Okay, I forgot about that one too. Everybody left him or died. Aisha stood at his side. Aisha came back. Aisha, best girl. <laughs> Massive creds to Aisha. I, he kind of hits on it later on, but yeah, I do believe there's an aspect of Lilia probably thinking best for Zenith. Took her away from there. Like, I need to get Zenith out of here. Norn, yeah, she was she was sick of him real quick. <laughs> but again, I don't blame anybody. How do I get stronger? Do I work on my magic? Maybe track down someone who can cast kingly or imperial spells? I don't think so. Based on what I've seen so far, spells past saintly level just get bigger in scale. They're not especially useful in combat. There were some exceptions, like that electric spell I came up with, but on a whole, my offensive capabilities are already adequate. The main issue is that I'm a glass cannon with mediocre mobility. I can't amplify my physical capabilities with auras, and that leaves me at a major disadvantage in both durability and speed. How do I compensate for my shortcomings? I found some, here it is. Call this, I call this. <laughs> I found some information on the fighting god in a book. Legend has it that he had a golden suit of armor that vastly enhanced his strength, speed, and endurance. When I discussed this with Zenoba, he came up with an intriguing idea. What if we made Zelef prosthesis that covered my entire body? Called it, <laughs> called it. <laughs> He's gonna make an Iron Man suit. <laughs> I don't know why I didn't think about this before. I can't envelop myself with an aura, true, but when I feed my mana into my artificial hand, I can enhance its strength dramatically. If I use my earth magic to create the sturdiest possible shell and then rework it into a full body suit of armor, yeah, I think this might work. With the help of Zenoba, I've completed my personal suit of armor. The thing stands more than two meters tall and it's bulky to boot. It takes a lot of mana to control it. In effect, I'm the only one that's capable of using this. And even I wouldn't be able to power it for that many days in a row. It's kind of like an oversized hunk of junk. In all honesty, if only Cliff were still alive. <laughs> Maybe then he could have made something more efficient. Could keep hitting on that one. It's so surprising every now and then having those moments of realization about how how significant certain people are to Rius. How they, how they aid him and assist him in certain ways. And Cliff, yes, is typically always the idea of it's either healing or it's making things efficient. But there was no point in dwelling on it now, I guess. In any case, I took a cue from my old video games and named it the Magic Armor. From this point, the diary turned to focus on his efforts to grow stronger. By nestling inside the Magic Armor, I could enhance my speed, power, and physical defense to match even the world's most powerful warriors. I could only maintain this level of performance for half a day at a time, but even at 30% output, I was capable of defeating most opponents I encountered. Bruce paused. They clearly hit on something special. While they weren't the first to come up with the idea, Given the stories about the fighting god, it made Rudis itching to start his own version. But he didn't know if Zenoba was capable of designing a suit at this stage. Either way, he was going to make it happen. Rudis is going to make his suit of armor. <laughs> He's literally dead set on it. On a less positive note, it seemed that his family moved out not long after Sylphie's death. That explained why it was less talk about them in the entries. Rudis could see Norn getting fed up with the womanizing quickly. But somehow, even Lilia gave up on him. Again, I think that's because Zenth was her priority. Which is surprising to say in the idea that, yes, Rudius saved her life and she wanted to repay him in some way. She does have limits. But again, I think it's a priority to Zenith. And I think even her, she'd probably think that Rudius would want her to do that. Rudius is not in a good state right now. And I can see him wanting me to do the right thing and protect Zenith. Just how bad did he treat them? Then again, he didn't know the specifics. Maybe they moved out for their own safety. He did have assassins from Millis coming after him. That's another good point. Yes, very much so a good point. It all made him want to score brownie points with his family. Fortunately, today was the day that Norm would be dropping by. An excellent reason to take them out for a meal. A little quality time wouldn't hurt. Suddenly, Aisha called out for lunchtime. He rose from a chair and opened the door to find Aisha in her usual maid outfit. There was a bit of sauce on her face, probably from doing taste testing. You've got a little on your face, kid. I said, taking out a handkerchief and wiping it off. <laughs> Thank you. She grinned cheerfully as he pulled his hand away. The kid was devoted enough to take care of him all by herself, even when he turned into a no good piece of trash. The old man hadn't mentioned her, but she was effectively the only family he had for years. It must have been a lot to have her around. Hopefully he wasn't doing anything to her. <laughs> if he was doing anything to Julie. <laughs> hey, Aisha, is there anything you've been wanting lately? Huh? Yeah, why are you asking? I was thinking about buying you a present one of these days. Just a thank you for all your hard work, you know. Aw, you shouldn't. I feel bad for Norn. I guess I did really see a cute hair clip at the store the other day. Wink, wink. She really did say the wink, wink part out loud. Who did she learn these shameless things from? Yeah, probably me. <laughs> All right, I'll take you out to buy it sometime soon. We'll have to keep it a secret from Norn. She let out an odd little yelp as she jumped back. She threw her hands up in an exaggerated display of shock. 
Are you actually serious, dear brother? What are you playing at here? Gasp! Could it mean that you're craving for some lovin'? Should I be waiting for your arrival in my bedroom tonight, my lord? Tee hee hee. Okay, enough fooling around. Let's go eat before the food gets cold. Yes, sir. They went to the dining room. Norn and Roxy weren't there at the moment, but they had a family meal with everyone else in the house. To Rudius, the food tasted better than normal. Sharing that with Lilia, he got a little smile out of her. <sighs> After lunch, he returned to the diary. With the magic armor complete, I began to travel the world, searching for a way to reach the man god. I met many different people in the course of these journeys, but was frequently distressed by how little information I could find about my enemy. Eventually, I hit on the theory that people who'd been alive for a very long time were more likely to know something about the man god and focus my attention on locating the oldest people in the world. This kind of plays into the whole thing that he learned from Badigati. This idea that it may be something that he heard, but he hasn't heard in a long time. It's implying the idea that the man god was at least present, or at least in action, in a long time ago. At the same time, I continued to train relentlessly as a mage and developed new spells, gradually growing more and more powerful than before. In time, I mastered gravity manipulation magic, a variety of electric spells, and even a kind of magic to manipulate the human voice. I also reached Saint Tear in healing. Why would he need to manipulate his voice? That is very interesting. What what purpose would he have to manipulate his voice? That's very that's a very odd thing to do. And it, that might be something that he got into maybe trying to master uh the Doldia tribe roar that stuns people. It could be something that he kind of hit doing that. But he probably had to do that in order to conceal who he was. If he's traveling around and maybe somebody overhears his voice and might think it might be Rudius or they know what his voice sounds like and he's trying to conceal his identity. But yes, gravity manipulation. <laughs> Again, before I, I kind of seen this in the uh, the extra chapter in Anahoshi meet and it was like, oh wow, that's, uh, that's interesting. That, that was something that's actually been brought up before and then he's finally getting it right here. But plays into this being the future Rudius and the idea that yes, one of the things that he was thinking about advancing was his electric spell. At this point in the diary, he came to the conclusion that magic itself was all-powerful, that it could be used to accomplish anything as long as he had a knack for it. Naturally, there was no explanation as to what the heck that was supposed to mean. There was then a section there where he recorded his theories on how Roxy caught petrification syndrome, the mouse, and the man god's potential responsibility for Sylphie's death. That is one of those interesting things, is like that's the plus and negative side of this being Rudius's diary, is that he's not writing this stuff because he's going to pass it on to himself. He's writing this because he's just trying to keep a diary. He, this is a plan that he made. Why would he explain to himself in his diary how things work? At a glance, it seemed like he was making progress at many fronts. But as more time passed without any new information about the man god, his future self began to grow increasingly bitter and hateful. At this point, he turned into a genuinely horrible person, provoking fights everywhere, crushing weaker opponents to sneer at them. He acted on impulse and instinct, even sexually assaulting random women. This sure as hell wasn't the kind of man he wanted to become. Again, this is where I'm starting to think that he's, the mana is polluting his mind. Again, I can see him doing this as a bitter person and losing all hope for everything and just becoming a nasty person. Again, he's literally becoming his old self. This person that just hates everybody and just focusing on self-satisfaction. But there is a side of me that almost wonders if it, this is the mana. The mana is doing this. It's, it's making it worse. Edis made frequent appearances in these entries. She kept popping up on his route as he traveled the world. Edis was powerful as ever, repeatedly defeating him. There was no clear mention of this in the text, but she might have been trying to show him the errors of his way. Yeah, that was kind of the hint I was getting earlier, but um, very interesting that despite the fact that Rudius now has this power suit, Edis is still beating him. And again, that could be possibly that he's not wanting to harm her, but she's beating him constantly. And if he's in this bitter state of assaulting people left and right, I can see him not holding back. His future self, however, began to think that she might be an agent of the man god. She was interfering with his progress after all. Therefore, she was clearly under his control and acting to protect his interest. Over time, he grew to hate her for it. Again, I don't see him holding back right here. And again, this is that whole like mind polluting thing that I think he's becoming like super like paranoid and everything. It honestly shocked Rudius to think that at some point he convinced himself of this, despite lacking any evidence whatsoever to support the theory. It was probably just what his future self wanted to believe. Eventually, Edda stopped. I like, <laughs> it's so great that Rudius is literally defending Edis right now. And again, this is where I think this is a good thing that he reads this before he writes the letter. He's literally defending Edis. He's understanding her. He Again, I think it's a lot because of what the old man planted into his head, that she was doing this all for him. Because I think that might have been planted in his head, he's... He's thinking about this stuff 
in a good sense. Plus, he's not in the mind of the old man that's, at this point, going nuts. Eventually, Edda stopped beating him so easily, and then stopped beating him at all. Maybe he grew stronger, or maybe she was past her peak physical years. It was hard to tell in the text. Finally, things came to a climax. The diary read, I made Edda's cry. It's been a long time since I saw her blubber like that. Maybe I took things too far. She might not be connected to the man god after all. No, that doesn't make any sense. The woman's been following me around and been getting in my way since Sylphie died. What else could explain it? She clammed up repeatedly during the interrogation. She knows something. She has to. He captured her and has been interrogating her. God, this is so bad. This is so bad. It is so bad. It's so funny that he points out that she's been in his way since Sylphie died. I mean, he's she's been following around before then, let's be honest. But still, he's saying since Sylphie died. Why would the man god be sending her at that point? Because you weren't under suspicion of him at that point. That doesn't make any sense. But still, it's like, this girl loved him. He rejected her. He turned into a mess. And she's been following around. What Reus is saying is probably keeping him in check, keeping him straight. And then he captures her, interrogates her. Forcing her to say what she wants, but she clammed up, probably not wanting to say that she's loved you all that time, and she wants you to correct it. She wants she, she wants Rudy's back. I just escaped today. I found her handcuffs with bite marks on them. Are the woman's teeth made of steel? Damn it all. I have an audience with Atoff tomorrow. It's hard to imagine that muscle head will give me anything useful. But like most of the immortal demons, she's been around for ages. There's a decent chance she knows something about the man god. I'll get that out of her, even if I have to beat her to a pulp. Next entry. Edis is dead. Ghislaine, blame me for everything. None of this makes any damn sense. I'm going to try to summarize what happened yesterday. My audience with Atoff turned into a battle. I was up against her and her entire personal guard. I was confident I could handle the Demon King, but more threw me off completely. I knew the man was a powerful mage, and I still let him catch me off guard. I was too focused on Atoff herself. They had me on the ropes when Edis jumped in out of nowhere. She took an attack meant for me, and died to save my life. Ghislaine told me why afterwards. She explained everything. Going back to the day, Edis showed up in Shreya. Edis just wanted to be with me. I had it all wrong. All this time. She never stopped loving me. Ever. That was the reason she followed me around. It was the only reason. I still can't believe it. Oh, such a massive hurt. Such a massive hurt. But again, it's like, Edis, just open your mouth, girl. Reus didn't get much detail from the entries, but it matched up with the old man said. Maybe he did need to marry Edis too. Reading all this made me want to see her end up happy. It was going to take some real courage to take that first step, though. He had vaguely broached the subject with Sylphie, but still. Well, the first step was talking it over in detail. Sending the letter was after that. Reus decided to push the topic from his mind until Roxy came home that night. Again, I think it was a good idea that he reads this before he writes it. And yes, reads it before he talks to them. Depending on how, again, he's going to be <laughs> approaching it. He returned to the diary. After Edis' death, there was a stretch of entries that said nothing particularly useful. Brief descriptions of travel to certain places. Meeting certain people, fighting others. Among those he battled, Reus noticed some truly fearsome opponents. A water emperor, a north emperor. But his victories didn't seem to bring much pleasure, as he didn't record the details. It's like, yeah, just another emperor. <laughs> just another, there's another emperor. They're done. Most of them were nothing more than sentence or two. I killed X today. He didn't know anything about the man god either. <laughs> He's going around just like killing people. You know anything about the man god? Don't. Nope. Dead. It, wow. But again, these people could be coming after him to kill him. And he would assume that they're working for the man god because they're coming after him, even though it's a lot of other reasons they could be coming after him. After a fair number of these entries, there was another skip forward. The first longer entry in a while was a very different nature than those before it. Zenoba is gone. Best bro Zenoba is gone. I don't even think that, yeah, I don't, I don't even think the elder Rudius even mentioned this when he was there. A unit of temple knights had infiltrated the kingdom of Renoa without anyone noticing. By the time I rushed back, it was too late. They burned the mansion to the ground. I found Zenoba's charred body in front of the door to the basement. Ginger, Julie, and Aisha were lying inside. Their bodies cut to pieces. I didn't realize this when I was reading it before, but yeah, Zenoba was probably protecting them. He probably had them go inside there, and he was probably guarding it. And they killed him, and they went in there. 
and they killed everybody else. Oof. The Aisha part hurts. <laughs> Zenoba hurts, yes. Julie hurts. Aisha, too. Because, she, again, she was the one that stayed. The Temple Knights were still in Renoa, so I tracked them down and killed them all. But murdering them was meaningless, of course. Zenoba did so much for me. He tried so hard to help me. Man, this is getting me... Zenoba is the one that's getting me emotional. And again, it's been hard for me to get find emotion in a story that's technically not for the current Rudeus. There, I do have a disconnect there. But every now and then it hits me. Zenoba did so much for me. He tried so hard to help me. And to protect my family. But I wasn't there for him when he needed me. What's the point in having all this power anyways? I'm useless. Everyone's dead now, I guess. I'm the only one still standing. The others are all gone. I couldn't protect any of them. It's all the man god's fault. I have to kill that bastard if it's the last thing I do. He's lost everybody. I mean, there's still Lilia and Zenith and all of them, but yeah, that's pretty much everybody. Rudeus thought that was a downer. He lost both Zenoba and Aisha in such a horrible way. It must have been crushing. Rudeus was curious why his future self didn't try to locate the rest of his family. Maybe he decided that he had no right to call himself Lucy's father. Or maybe Lilia and the others died as well, and he didn't record it. Norn hadn't come up in a long time either, which wasn't exactly reassuring. Okay, he had to stop speculating. It wasn't in the diary. It didn't happen. In any case, it didn't seem like Zenoba's death was necessarily the man God's doing, but his future self was blaming everything on him. At this point, he had clearly developed a single mind obsession with revenge. He threw himself into the search for the man God even more intensely than before, butchering anyone that stood in his way. And finally, he found a lead. The next entry read, My heart is pounding as I write this. I'm currently in a remote corner of the Begrit continent. This was said to be an uninhabited, unexplored region, but I discovered an ancient ruin here. A remnant of the ancient Dragonfolk civilization. And on its walls, I found murals lined with writing. I, I, I'm increasingly, <laughs> increasingly seeing how much the Dragonfolk are tied in with the past. And again, technically like in the original story, if it's true, this idea of this dragon god going around to all the other sides of the world and destroying them. And that destroying all those worlds until there's only one world left. And so it makes me believe that like they've been doing something for a purpose. Maybe that original incursion across all the worlds is to destroy them all to get to the middle. There's there's so much showing these dragon folks, partly because they live for a long time, but partly because they're like seeking knowledge. And you see later on this idea they were seeking a way to get into the mill area, the barren area. It makes me believe that these folks were really invested in this. And it could all be in the idea that they wanted to kill a man god. It doesn't specify it, but I do believe the ancient dragonfolk civilization was trying to kill the man god. On its walls, I found murals lined with writing. This is what was read on them. This world is divided into six. The world of the dragons, the world of the men, the world of the demons, the world of the beasts, the ocean world, and the sky world. These six worlds arrayed like a face on a great cube. The inside of the cube was a place known as the barren world. There's the bringing up of the barren world again. Last time we talked about the barren world was this idea of them using uh, spirit summoning to pull them from the barren world. But again, Nanahoshi kind of figured that that was just incorrect, that they were actually just coding these things. But don't tell anybody that. Like this area that seemingly seems like it's supposed to be an afterlife for people of this world. Not that we've really had anybody actually talk about it, not, not that I'm aware of, um, but that kind of is what they're assuming there. And so on that, uh, technically on that sense, that would make sense why the dragon folk were trying to get there, is maybe they wanted to get to where the people were. But specifically, they're saying the idea that later on they want to get to the center of it, where the man god is. Passing through it was the only way to travel from one face of the cube to another. But this was only possible by means of a very specific method. Unfortunately, the mural had crumbled away after this section. But the very last legible sentence read as followed. The man god stands at the center of the barren world. So my theory was correct. Every time they're, te every time they're teleporting and stuff like that, they're going through this barren world. And that's why it looks the same. So she's over here. He's like way over here, right in the dead center. I finally found what I was looking for. I'm planning to stay here for some time to thoroughly analyze everything written on these walls. The mural contains a historical record of the Dragon Folk's attempt to find a way to the barren world center. Summoning and teleportation magic were apparently developed as offshoots of the research into spells for traveling through the barren world to reach the others. I may need to focus my research in that direction. I like how detailed this stinking writer is. You know that he's been thinking about this for a long time. It's like, it's so crazy to think of like how, how far back there Refugian was probably thinking about this. Again, we had this whole thought process or this whole discussion about the, 
the six-sided world. We talked about that whole history a long time ago, and this idea that, again, the dragon god traveled from one side of it to the other. Oh, well, that technology to travel in the same world is that same technology, because yes, they're they're both going through the barren world. Um, super cool. I found everything that it is to find in these ruins. It seems the ancient dragon folk attempted to create something that would allow them to reach the center of the barren world, but I don't know what that something was. The section of the wall describing it was crumbled into dust. Still, their method was clearly something quite similar to summoning or teleportation magic. Unfortunately, I don't have the knowledge I need to create the kind of spell that was described. Pedagush might, however. I don't know anyone else familiar with summoning spells. Perhaps he can point me in the right direction. Come forward. Pedagush knew nothing. He doesn't even know who or what the man god is, for that matter. That's interesting. The fact that he would have that archway, the fact that it would identify people that have something to do with the man god, but yet he doesn't know anything about the man god, and how you... Again, he's he's confronting him because uh, that was one of my fears. The idea of like what would happen if he talked to Pettigoose about him, um, because of that archway, they're obviously looking for somebody. For what point? For what purpose? If he doesn't even know anything about him, the only thing that Pettigoose does know is that Laplace flew into a furious rage at the mere mention of him. <laughs> where's my where's my list of theories? Crap. Delete. <laughs> Delete. Damn it. Uh, okay, so Man God apparently is not Laplace. Seemingly. But Laplace was no longer among the living. That's interesting. Because um, I, I even theorized before in the idea that there's a possibility, because he mentioned the idea that he hadn't met Laplace, that it was a possibility that Laplace lived, and that that would probably mean that Pedagus died. Or Pedagus is just chasing him around everywhere and can't seem to find him. Uh, but no, it, it seems that Laplace is dead. It could, be, it could have been Pedagus or not. It did seem to imply that Pedagus did confront Laplace, because that was how he asked about it. I don't know why he asked about it. That's a good question mark. But I wonder if that's the whole aspect of, again, the dragon folk. The, all the dragon folk want to find the man god. It's interesting that Pettigoose doesn't know anything about him, but Pettigoose could be looking for the man god, just like uh, Orsted is. Again, I'm thinking that dragon folk had some bad running with the, with the man god. And again, it could be the idea that man god had them do that, or they're doing the destruction of all the side's worlds to get to the man god. This is just... My mind's going a million directions. I gotta stop. <laughs> My mind's going a million directions. I suppose there's Orsted. Maybe he knows something. I can't find so much as a rumor about Orsted's whereabouts. I don't think I'll ever track that man down, no matter how hard I try. Maybe I'm better off focused my research on the teleportation magic. After decades of constant battle, I can't move as nimbly as I used to. I may not have much time left to waste. No, it's too early to throw in a towel. I should try to find more dragon folk runes while I'm still capable of traveling. Ruiz pause reading. So, this world was like a hollow cube with the man god at the center. That was a little disturbing. It did explain why teleportation always felt like you're being sucked underground. You were being pulled into the barren world and traveled through it to your destination. That, of course, that didn't mean that if you dig straight down to the ground, you'd reach the man god. The connection between the worlds probably wasn't that literal. Again, that was like one of those things that I kind of thought about with the aspect of, is this a flat world or is it spherical? Is it is it like, because we only have a map to go by and it's not like they ever went beyond the, the stretches of the sea, but... It's still a funny thought. Back to the diary, I jumped forward in time again. It read, I discovered a second dragon folk ruin high in the mountains of the demon continents. I wish I understood why they built these things in such dangerous, well-hidden places. The whole area is swarm with powerful monsters. Maybe because they don't want anybody knowing their research. <laughs> again, because they're going after the man god, maybe maybe they don't want anybody to know that will leak that information to the man god. Rius thought, I suppose Betagus's floating fortress might qualify as a ruin, in some sense of the word. Maybe this is number three then. In any case, I plan on exploring it tomorrow. My efforts were rewarded. I found a complete version of the Merle I studied some years ago, including the section describing their method for reaching the center of the barren world. The ancient dragon folk created five sacred treasures. Using all five of these will send you to the barren world instead of merely passing through it. I finally found a way to reach the man god, finally. But I'm over 60 now and my body's in terrible condition. I don't know if I'll make it in time. I paid Pettigus a visit. This time, he had information for me. The five sacred treasures created by the ancient dragon folk are held by the five generals. All of them are necessary to open the door to the barren world by means of the dragon god's secret art. However, one of these generals is already dead and their treasure is lost. The whereabouts of their successor are also unknown. This is getting, this is getting like super GRPG right now. You gotta collect the five murals and then put them at the, the gate and it will open to the barren world. And that's where the last boss is. It kind of makes me wonder how much of this is actually legit. Pettigus believed their missing general will appear in a few decades. Something about the way that he worded it struck me as odd, but I can't remember exactly why. Lately, it's getting hard to pry open the cabinet of my memories. Is Pettigus still hiding something from me? It was an infuriating thought. 
but he's the only person left who am I can reminisce about the better days with. I don't want to kill him. He's already think he's already considering killing Pettigrew. Like he's literally like bloodthirsty at this point. Like he's killed so much that it means nothing to him anymore. He has lost that barrier. He's lost that barrier from push, push, just kill. He did say Orshid might know something about the secret art, but nobody had the slightest idea where Orshid was. In any case, if it's going to be decades before the last dragon general appears, there's no hope left for me. I'm sure I won't live that long. Yeah, the whole thing about the sacred treasures, um, jokes aside, um, there are five sacred treasures created by the ancient dragon folk, and they're held by the five generals. It's going to be a while before successor returns. Like, this idea that they have to pass down to somebody or somebody gets chosen. And it makes me kind of wonder if they're, I wonder, I kind of wonder if the, if the dragon world still exists and they're appearing from there. Not this, or this idea that they have to like reincarnate at some point. Like they're sort of like, uh, Kishirika and whatnot. Like she gets killed and she's come back later on. It's very interesting. But yeah, it makes me curious what he's meaning there and the idea that the way that he wore that struck him as odd. Pettigus believes that the missing general will appear within a few decades. My body was already on the verge of breaking down. I can feel death creeping up on me. What am I supposed to do, damn it? I'm running out of time. I can't get my hands on all five Dragon General's treasures. I don't think I'm capable of creating my own invitations or reproducing the secret art itself. There's just not enough to go on. I wouldn't know where to start. In other words, I can't make it to the barren world. And that's gotta suck. Like his, he spent his whole, like a chunk of his life just doing nothing but looking for this option and he can't do it. I'm sick and tired of this. How long am I going to have to keep struggling forward alone? What am I even doing this for? Even my hatred for the man god is starting to dull. I'm just so damn tired. Bruce felt the determination and fire from the earlier entries gave way to resignation and bitterness. There weren't many pages left, so these entries were probably from 50 years in the future. Bruce's future self spent decades struggling constantly with precious few successes and never reached his goal. After a certain point, anyone would grow exhausted to think straight. The person Bruce was today would probably have given up much earlier. Continuing the diary, it read, I usually keep my research notes separate from this diary, but I'm going to add an entry here about my latest theory. During my research of teleportation magic, I arrived at an interesting thesis, specifically by combining it with magic described on the ancient murals and tweaking with the execution, it might be possible to travel back in time. However, if my theory is correct, it could require an enormous amount of mana to travel even a few seconds backwards. How much would you need to jump back years then? I'm going to try to travel the past. I still have this old diary in my hands. Using it as a focal point, I just might be able to jump back to the day I started writing it. The day when the man god tricked me into releasing the mouse and killing Roxy. I don't know if it's going to work. I don't know what'll happen to me if it does work either. I'm familiar with the concept of time paradoxes after all. I wish I had more confidence this will work. I'm gonna have to add this to one of my theories. This is starting to make me think that possibly the... Again, because it's that whole idea that everything is sort of linked in some way. Summoning, teleportation, all that kind of stuff is still like similar in some way. The color the style and all that kind of stuff, just how you're functioning it. I wonder if the displacement incident was a time travel. It's hard to say that I'll jump back in time as I am now, or if I'll revert to my younger self. Assuming it's the former though, I need to go over what I'm going to say. At the very least, I need to cover the petrification syndrome incident, Edis, and the man god. I'm not sure if I'll be able to explain it all. I'm not sure my younger self will even believe me. And if I revert instead, I don't even know how I'll be able to interact with Sylphie or Roxy. That's an interesting thing. Like he wants to go back like he figured out how to do this. He's going to go back. He doesn't know how it's going to work. Am I going to pop next to my younger self? And then I'm going to explain the whole situation to him. Or will I become my younger self? Will it, just, will it just be like a rewind of time? Or is it a travel loop? It's a very interesting thing that he even considered that. But it's still sad the idea that if I go back there and my younger self, Roxy and Sylphie walk in the door. I don't know how I'm going to be able to interact with them. Like how do you interact with them? I do want to see them again, of course. I want to tell them how sorry I am. All that regret. But the thought of overriding the mind of a young, happy man with mine is honestly kind of sickening. He's like, this old self, my young self, the one that he literally talks to when he travels back in time. I don't want to override that. He's happy. I know he's happy right here. Perhaps I should take some more time to experiment first. But given the potential risk of time paradox, I'm hesitant to do so. Say I were to hop back several days in time. What if I leave my memories behind in the process? I'll be trapping myself in an endless, meaningless loop, doing myself to live in this miserable world for all eternity. At least I'll be able to see Roxy and Sylphie again the other way. All right, enough of this. I'm going to stop overthinking things. It's not like I have anything left to lose anyways. I accomplished nothing with my life. I'm a waste of oxygen. Maybe I'll screw this thing up and ruin everything again. But so what? Why should I even give a damn? And if I succeed, well, maybe I can give the man god a taste of his own medicine.
closed it. <laughs> it's finally over. It's finally over. Too much to take in. It's finally over. Woof. Woof. Once he finished reading the final entry, Rudius closed the diary. The back cover was scarred and battered, just like the front. After reading it, he could see the meaning in those scratches. They were a testament to the long, painful years he spent carrying it around. Surprised he never lost it this whole time, honestly, with that story. Rudius's future self must have jumped back in time immediately after finishing the entry, only to realize that he'd ran out of mana in the process. Rius couldn't begin to understand the principles behind using teleportation magic to travel through time. That said, he wasn't sure why he'd come back in one great leap. Based on what he wrote, it would have been safer to have hopped back in multiple steps to avoid mana issues. Was he just too old and tired to realize the benefits of that approach? No, it probably didn't occur to him that he might not have enough mana for this. The man must have had an absolute confidence in his ability to cast any spell. In any case, the diary simply didn't hold all the details Rius needed in his research. There was no guarantee that his conclusions he drew were entirely correct either. He could have misinterpreted those ancient murals for one thing. I like that he's actually questioning it. And again, that's what I was mentioning earlier in the idea of, of creating, uh, creating preventions for certain things that honestly him creating that might be for something that was misinterpreted or misseen or again was rumored from somebody else. But I still think it's kind of interesting the idea of him questioning. Why didn't you do jump? Regain mana, jump, regain mana, jump. Is it, again, the fact of him being overconfident? I could do this. Is it a fact? Because it, it seems like the idea is that he depleted so much mana to get here and they had that, that gouge. Well, obviously that shows that if he had maybe a little more mana, he probably would have had his stomach. But again, it could be, it could be an aspect that, yes, he, he was confident. Just tired. Don't care if it works or not. I just want to go back. I want to see them one more time. I want to I want to get revenge somehow, and this is probably the only way that I can get revenge is go back and tell him, and maybe he can get it. But he never tell he, he never tells Rudius to go kill the man god. That's the thing. He never tells Rudius to go kill the man god. He wanted to. He wanted to get revenge, stick it to him. But maybe it's more of an idea of sticking it to him by making sure that this other Rudius doesn't fall into his trap. But again, that whole idea of him not thinking that through, like the way that Rudius is now, might be an aspect again that I wonder if that mana is affecting his mind. It's gonna, I'm going to stick on this theory so much. <laughs> it's going to probably bug people. Come to think of it, Rudius did see the old murals in Pedagus' fortress. That one didn't seem to have anything to do with summoning magic. Yeah, I'm going to have to go back and look at it here after this. But from the sound of things, there were many others of its kind hidden away across the world. For now, Rudius had answers to his most important questions. Now he needed to take action before he ended up going down the same road. Just then, Roxy called from the entrance. Back from work. Perfect timing. First things first, tonight, he needed to have a serious discussion with his two wives. They needed to know about Edis and the fact that they were all in danger. Oh, and that's chapter two. Um, good stuff, good stuff. Uh, yeah, it, it, that last line I questioned for a minute, but I'm like, yeah, it technically makes sense. He's, at this point, fearful that there's a possibility that the man god's after him. Because um, that's really the only thing that I can think of. Other than the idea of, of Edis showing up and there being an issue there as well. But yeah, um, quite quite a set of chapters. Quite quite a set of chapters. One and two were absolutely insane. But um, there you go. I'm looking forward to how Rudis is going to explain this to, to Sylphie and, and Roxy. I mean, theories. He could claim that he seen a vision, met somebody that seen a vision. I mean, we have, no, I was, I was thinking of like Kishirika and stuff with like the eye of, of foresight and things like that, but that's not really the same kind of concept there. I mean, it is sort of the same and it could be the same type of magic, but it's not really the same. Um, I just don't know how he's going to really kind of mention this idea to them besides just kind of being clear or saying that he heard from somebody that something happens. Um, or he could claim that he just got a letter that described what's going on with Edis and he's going to help her out with that. But again, the whole thing about the, the rat and everything, I guess he could explain that. Yes, I, I went into the basement and noticed there was a rat down there and pretty sure that the teeth that it had is a sign of petrification syndrome and that's a danger to us and everything like that. I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll see. But um, I know he's not going to say the man god is a thing. I don't know that he's going to really... He's never mentioned the man god to either one of the two of them, if I remember correctly. He's only talked to Rajurd about the man god. And yes, he blubbed it out that he's met the man god to Orsted in front of Rajurd and Edis. But I don't think he's told anybody else about the man god, if I remember correctly. But yes, chapter three, resolve.
I was not expecting this. <laughs> I was not expecting the manga to pop up so quickly. I was making <laughs> I was making a joke with some folks on Discord and the idea that it it almost I, it didn't really dawn on me at the time, but I'm like, yeah, if you think about it with with yes, as we kind of confirm with this chapter, the man god did see what Rudius did, did see the future Rudius pop up. But it was like I have that mentality of like after the last man god visit, because at some point um, in volume five, the man god mentions to Rudius that he can't just grab anybody because Rudius is like, just find somebody else. And he's like, well, I can't do that. Well, just like come back in a year. It doesn't work that way. The way the man god at the time it kind of explained it was that it's this isn't like something where I can just whenever it, it certain things have to be in play one the person they have to be on a certain wavelength with me and additionally there's the idea that yes he he claimed that th certain things have to align like I can't just do this whenever and so there was the side of me that was thinking <laughs> I could see like when the future radius pops up it's like you can see the man guy go crap what the hell and he's like hitting the call button trying to call Rudy it's like now now I need to visit now I need to visit now <laughs> answer the phone um so I could totally see this being like oh crap finally I have a chance to talk to him but yeah let's let's get into this we, we don't we're not there quite yet so let, let's jump into this we open chapter three from the perspective of Sylphiette yes Rudy was acting strange lately, spending entire days held up in study. Then, when he came out, he was pale and anxious. It made Sylphie worried, wondering what he was doing in there. However, he wouldn't give her a straight answer when she asked. He just dodged her questions and pulled her into the bed with him. She knew he had something on his mind, and it was starting to bother her. Asking Roxy for advice, Sylphie found Roxy felt the same way. Roxy knew Rudy kept things bottled up inside, so they needed to be ready to support him. I do like to see this kind of different... This is the, the, the juiciest thing I think I found in chapter three, besides the man god stuff, <laughs> is seeing from Sylphie's perspective how she sees the relationship differently than Roxy. And I, I'll get more into this later on, but I love that dynamic between the two of them. It was the thing that I was kind of excited about initially with Roxy showing up is this, this difference in chemistry here. Sylphie decided that if things drug out any longer, they would need to press him for answers. But then, just after dinner, Rudy finally broke his silence. Uh, Sylphie, Roxy, could I trouble the two of you to come by to my room this evening? His tone was a little awkward, but that wasn't too unusual. That was how he sounded whenever he wanted to sleep with the both of them at once. Sylphie never understood why he was so hesitant about those things, as he had nothing to feel guilty about. She's like, <laughs> why is he bothered? <laughs> There's nothing wrong with this. <laughs> she just sees things so differently than Rudy is. Again, back then when Rudy was talking about doing this whole threesome thing, it was like he was so afraid that he was going to offend them or something. Following this, Roxy and Sylphie made their usual preparations for the evening. Bath, perfume, underwear, nightgown. Rudy seemed to prefer soft nightgowns with sleeves over skimpy ones. That technically makes sense. I, I, Rudy has talked to before in his own mind the idea that like, with the with the eye, like there was one eye that allowed you to see through things like an x-ray vision. And he's like, but I don't really find that to be interesting. It's, it's like the whole process of taking it off is what <laughs> excites him. Sylphie considered unbuttoning more to show more skin. She wasn't busty, but she did notice him staring down her shirt when she was undone before. Roxy was wearing her usual one piece. She had nothing underneath it. <laughs> Girl go <home> commando. <laughs> Shelfie thought that she was pretty aggressive in her own right. They then took a few deep breaths before heading to Rudy's bedroom. Rudy was sitting quietly in his chair. I like this idea that they're like all getting prepared for <laughs> what he wants and they walk to the door and he's sitting there like, what? No, no, not, <laughs> that's not what I called you here for. <laughs> they technically needed it afterwards. The two of them sat down next to each other on the bed. Typically, Rudy's would then sit between them with a grin, but today he looked different. He had a serious expression and wasn't moving from his chair. After a long moment, uh, Roxy? Yes? How's Norna quitting herself at school? Why ask me? Didn't Norn tell you herself just the other day? Well, I was hoping to get some candid impressions from you as an educator. Sylphie found his choice of words strange. <laughs> and she noticed Roxy being amused as well. She was honestly afraid of how long he'd be keeping this up because it was hard not to laugh. <laughs> She's like noting the fact that he's like, why is he talking this way? <laughs> it sounds weird. Uh, all right then. Her academic performance is average and she's making fairly slow progress with the sword. I'm impressed by her efforts with the student council though. She seems to be earning some recognition for her disciplinary work in particular. <laughs> Norn's because, <laughs> Norn's joined the, the, the discipline, <laughs> disciplinary council. <laughs> I could just totally see that her walking around with the, the thing around her shoulder. <laughs> she's like yelling at people for yelling in the hallways. <laughs> The university has quite a few rowdy students, but everyone listens to her when she scolds them. But she's also earned a great deal of affection from some of the older students. Either way, no one ever tries to pick a fight with her, and she seems to have a lot of friends. I don't think you have anything to worry about. Very cool to know. Really cool to know. I, again, this is like a nice contrast to Nora when she first appeared there. This idea that she was 
herself comparing herself to Rudeus. And every time she heard something about Rudeus and how he should do this or that, whatever, and that was frustrating her. She felt like she was being compared to him. Now she's made it her own. Like she's, yes, again, I do acknowledge in Roxy is as well, this idea that, yeah, there's probably a side of it that is because she's your sister. But I do think that she's developing her own status. And yes, adoration from her fans. <laughs> I wonder how much of this is her fan club. <laughs> hmm, I see. Thank you very much. Sylvie knew Roxy wasn't exaggerating. No one was doing her best out there. From what student council members told her, she was probably the hardest worker they ever had. Sometimes, Sylphie wished that she could be more of a big sister to Norn. That sucks, because uh, that was kind of the, the hope that I had there, subconsciously, is that this would be a good way for Norn and Sylphie to kind of meet each other and get to know each other. And what about you, Roxy? What do you mean? Has anything been bothering you lately? Maybe you've been getting peckish a lot, grabbing lots of snacks from the kitchen? Uh, no. You've been actually pushing me to eat so much food lately that I'm worried that I might put on a little weight. How are things going with school then? Oh, well enough. I suppose there's a few students that are making fun of me for being short or refusing to pay attention to my lectures, but that's fairly rare. What? They're ignoring your classes? What a bunch of hopeless ingrates. How about I teach them a lesson in manners? I'll make sure they grovel at your feet the next time they see you. Huh? N no, I, I don't think that's necessary. This just comes with the territory when you're a new teacher, really. But thank you for the offer anyways. Exasperated, Roxy bowed. <laughs> Sylphie understood how she felt, but sometimes felt a little envious of how deeply Rudy respected her. I do appreciate that idea of kind of showing, yes, Sylphie has accepted Roxy, but there's still an aspect there that even with that acceptance of the idea of the harem, it, no matter what you, no matter how open of a person you are to the idea, you're still going to have that jealousy. You're still going to see, I wish he did that to me, or I wish that respect that he was showing Roxy is something he would do with me. Anyways, I, I guess there's one other thing that's been on my mind. And what is that, if you don't mind me asking? I prefer to be sure about this one before I tell you anything in particular. I look forward to hearing all about it then. Yeah, she's obviously bringing up the, the pregnancy. <laughs> Sophie thought that she knew what it was about. Roxy had mentioned feeling a bit odd lately. Sophie wanted to plan a celebration, but feels that it might be a little bit too premature. All right then, Sophie? Yes, Rudy? As his attention went to Sophie, she tilted her head to the side, trying to look as charming as possible. His gaze went down to her upper body, signaling a success to her strategy. <laughs> it's like, you know, button a little bit. Oh, it worked. <laughs> How, um, how's Lucy been doing lately? Well, you're keeping an eye on her yourself, aren't you? She's happy and healthy baby. You haven't overheard her muttering in the heavens above and this earth below. I alone am uniquely honored or anything. Have you? <laughs> I love these dumb little comments like this. <laughs> it's very specific. It's very specific. What the heck are you talking about? Um, I think she might be crawling around on her own before too long. Hmm. Sylphie thought Lilia was a big help. Princess Ariel felt that children were best raised by their maids and attendants, rather than the mothers. But Grandma Ellen Lace told her that she should try to give her child as much personal love and care as she could. She tended to agree with Ellen Lace, and Rudy wanted her to be involved with raising Lucy. So she was putting a lot of time and effort into that. That's a very cool thing to kind of see. And it, it, again, this is something that I've been kind of questioning over the last, what, probably two volumes or so. This idea of really trying to understand how Sylphie sees Lucy and her care. Because again, yes, the, the question marks kind of raise a lot is whenever Rudius goes to do something, Sylphie's like, I'm coming too. And again, what Rudius sort of came to conclusion of is that there's a possibility that Sylphie seen that, well, she made it just fine without her parents. So maybe she feels the idea of not always having to be with Lucy as being a requirement. And this is kind of that sign there that she's, yeah, she's kind of in that mixed area of she's been with Ariel for many years, more years than Rudeus in this, in this current timeline, at least when her, her and her teens. So it does make sense that hearing from Ariel all the time that the maids handle it, don't worry. Yes, she would have that assumption. So it's a nice little thing to kind of add to how she views the raising of Lucy. And the idea that with Ellen Lace pushing on her and Rudy kind of pointing it out as well, she's like, okay, I understand. I'm going to try to do this. I'm working really hard on this. Have you noticed anything strange lately, Sylphie? Anything on your mind? Not really. Uh, I, I guess I'm wondering why my husband's hiding something from me. But that's about it. But that's... <laughs> It's it's not doesn't mess with how I say it, but it's technically is a moment. So here we go. Here's our here's our dose of what the hell seven sees. But that's about it. But that's <laughs> again. It's like easily autocorrect can catch that. It's just it never gets old. But yeah, <laughs> Sylphie, getting the claws out. I wish she would talk to me. 
<laughs> That's about it. I'm wondering why you're not talking to me. Sylvie hadn't intended to be harsh about it, but the words just came out. Uh, right. Rudy averted his gaze nervously. Sorry about that. His gaze turned determined. Whenever his eyes got like that, Sylphie knew that he was at his best. I'm kind of wondering what that's what that's implying, the idea that she's kind of seen this gaze and that's kind of his game mode. Like she's used to him whenever he gets in this kind of a look, it, it's something serious and he's, he's about to lay down something, I don't know. Actually, this is exactly the reason I asked the two of you to drop by tonight. Roxy and Sylphie straightened up, although Roxy's expression was a little uncertain. The problem is, I'm not sure how to explain it. I guess I'll start from the beginning. A few days ago, I met a certain individual. <laughs> a certain individual? <laughs> Could you be more specific? Right, he was something like a blessed child, I guess. One that had the power to predict the future. So this is the route he's gonna go. <laughs> I guess, again, it, it technically makes sense. The best way to explain the situation without having to say who it is, it, in the logic of this world, makes sense that, oh yeah, there's there's a possibility there could be a blessed child that has this ability. Rudy went on to describe the conversation. Details alarming. There was someone that wanted to harm Rudy and his family. Terrible things might happen to them if the enemy had his way. In order to keep them safe, Rudy might have to do some things that seemed strange from time to time. To be honest, Sylphie wanted to think that he was taking it too seriously, but she could tell that he was convinced that it was true and keeping details to himself. There was probably parts of the story he thought was best not to know. It didn't feel great, but she could understand why he wanted to be cautious of the situation. There's that struggle there. It's like, please be honest with me, but at the same time, trusting the other person is keeping details for a reason. Sylphie then spoke up. Okay then, uh, is, is there anything that we can do to help? I'm sure there will be. To be honest, though, I'd rather not put the two of you in much danger. Sylphie thought, there, he went again. This was something coming up a lot lately. Sylphie felt that it was something that started happening after Paul's death. It was nice to know that he cared about them, but he could get a little too overprotective. Sylphie felt that she wasn't a helpless child anymore and could pull her own weight. So yes, obviously she sees the same thing that Ruiz is doing. From Ruiz's perspective, this whole time since Paul's death is constantly in his mind going, I don't want to have the same thing happen that with Paul. I don't want to lose somebody again. I can't lose somebody precious to me again, especially not Roxy and Sylphie specifically. But on the reverse end, that's frustrating to somebody that feels like they're capable, but yet they're not being allowed to help. It is kind of one of those conundrums in the idea that from Ruiz's perspective, I don't want to lose them if I'm not good enough to protect them. From the opposite perspective, it is the same thing. <laughs> Sylphie doesn't want to lose Rudius. And so him saying, I don't want to lose you, I'm going to go alone. It's like, well, I don't want to lose you, so don't go alone. Doesn't that mean that you'll be putting yourself in danger without us to help? Can't say for sure yet, but it's pretty likely, yeah. Well, I don't like the sound of that. Rudy was a powerful mage, but Sylphie knew that he didn't want to fight anyone. I like that she's picked up on that. I don't know that he specifically ever told her that. I, I could be misremembering. But yes, she understands that this isn't, he, he doesn't like going around harming people. Yet, Sylphie thought, he was always flying off on some mission and nearly getting himself killed. Was she supposed to sit around and cheer him up when he limped back home? It was starting to get old for her. She wanted to go with him at least, that she might be helpful somehow. Then again, she didn't want to be a liability for him. Acknowledging the idea that she wants to be there at his side, but at the same time, acknowledging that me being there, and if I'm not strong enough, still having that mindset deep in there that she's not as good as Rudeus, that everybody has, that they're not as powerful as Rudeus. And so yes, being at his side, just hold him back. Roxy then spoke up. All right, I understand. At the time she was fiddling with her hair. She looked Rudy in the eyes and smiled. While you're out and about, I'll keep Norn and Aisha safe. She stated that with confidence, like she genuinely accepted her role to play. Sylphie spoke up. Are you really okay with that, Roxy? Sylphie couldn't help but think that Roxy wanted to tag along too, but Roxy just nodded. I know Rudy would rather put himself at risk than see his family in danger. Sure, but Sylphie knew that Roxy had been there when Rudy had lost his father. It was hard to picture just how devastated Rudy was by that tragedy. From the sound of things, he had sunk into a very deep depression. It was enough for him to break his promise with Sylphie. She then thought, cut it out, Sylphie. You're just being sulky now. Rudy had come back to me in the end. That was what really mattered, right? I love this. I love this stuff. I, I know that people don't like me when I point stuff like this out, but I love seeing flaws in characters. I love seeing jealousy. I love seeing human emotion. There's nothing wrong with this statement that Sylphie has. She is being human here, even though she's part elf and all that, but that aside, it shows that despite the fact that she's accepted Roxy into the family, she still has a bit of a jealousy in there. In the end, he broke his promise. 
He promised me and he broke it. It adds layer to the character themselves that they're not just an openly accepting person. There is these restrictions. We'll get into more here in a bit. And this idea of expanding on her mindset of accepting more wives for Rudy. And this idea that there is a hesitancy there. I mean, it, even later on, she says specifically, yes, I would love him all to myself. I just know that's not what he wants. And she wants what he wants. Roxy continued. That said, Sylphie, I don't intend to just sit around and watch while Rudy puts his life at risk for us. We can keep a careful eye on him. And if we decide that he really needs our help, we'll follow him whether he wants us to or not. That made sense to Sylphie. They didn't need his permission to help him. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> True. Yeah. I mean, technically I'll follow him no matter what. <laughs> they could just make up their own minds. As long as things turned out all right in the end, they wouldn't have any reason to complain. Yeah, I guess you're right. Okay. Sylphie knows that Rudy was listening with a half smile and trust in his eyes. She expected him to try to tell them off, but he didn't. Roxy continued. You go off and do what you want, Rudy. Don't worry about things back here. We'll keep it safe and sound. All right, then. It's good to know that I'll have you watch my back if things get ugly. Sylphie seen relief in Rudy's smile. It may just be her imagination, but she thought that his eyes were shining slightly. She had to admit that she was impressed by how smoothly Roxy handled this. There was a reason Rudy respected her so much. In any case, the most important thing right now is that Rudy could approach this challenge with a clear mind. It's the idea of like, we'll have things handled here. We've accepted the situation. Yes, there's that caveat there of if it gets ugly, we're going to step in. You don't, we're not going to get your permission if it looks like you're in trouble. But at least that alleviates his mind. He can think about the current situation clearly because he doesn't have to worry about all this other stuff. He doesn't have to worry about what Roxy's thinking. He doesn't have to worry about what Sylphie's thinking. He doesn't have to worry about how, how are they going to handle Lucy? Is, is Norm doing okay? They're going to handle this situation. Focus on what you're focusing on. Because again, that goes back to what Sylphie said earlier in this idea of not wanting to become a liability. And having those worries and those struggles about how the situation is going to be handled with all of these other things in play can take away your focus. If Rudy got in trouble, Sylphie could always help him out. She'd be the good, loyal wife most of the time. But when things got ugly, she'd ride in to the rescue. That was the kind of relationship she wanted. <laughs> she wants to... <laughs> that, is, that is that is kind of one of those kind of interesting, like, interesting ways that she's thinking about the situation and the idea of like, yeah, that's how I always want to be. I want to be that that perfect wife that always taking care of him. But when things get ugly, I come in to rescue him. Because again, that goes back to what way back here in Boyna Village. Let's go way back. Yes, when Rudy first got taken away, you know, he got knocked out by Paul, thrown in the carriage, go to leave. That was the moment that she promised herself that she'd get stronger to protect Rudy. She wanted to get stronger to help him. And so that's the thing. That's, that's the relationship that she wanted. I want to be there and protect him when I can. Um, moving on. There was one other thing, actually. I'm not sure how to put this, to be honest. Roxy spoke up gently, trying to ease him forward. Is it an awkward problem? Very awkward. It's not easy thing for me to tell you to. I, I think um, there's a chance we might add one more person to the family. He's finally dropping it. <laughs> He's finally dropping it. Sylphie thought, Humph, is he talking about a woman? Yeah, that had to be it. Sylphie knew that she couldn't complain. He dropped a few hints before, and she hadn't objected before or discouraged him. That didn't mean that she'd give her approval to just anyone, though. Her feelings about this weren't quite simple. Again, I love this. Let's expand it. Let's get into this. Let's really figure out how she views this whole situation. Who is it? Nanahoshi? Sylphie tried to keep her voice neutral. If it was Nanahoshi, she felt like that would be wrong. She didn't think that Nanahoshi loved Rudy in the way that they did. Her feelings were more like gratitude. Nanahoshi probably wouldn't refuse Rudy if he pushed a relationship, but that didn't mean that she'd welcome it. No, it's not Nanahoshi. This whole thing is like really interesting to me because yes, technically we kept getting hints that Sylphie was a bit uneasy about Nanahoshi. From Sylphie's perspective back here in the university, there was a lot of jealousy, but that was before they became married. And after they got married, that's when Sylphie kind of established this idea of bring them to me, let me meet them, all that kind of stuff. But there was always this hint that she was jealous of Nanahoshi, that she was uneasy with Rudius around Nanahoshi. And again, that turned that whole teasing that she was doing of Rudy that he took very, very seriously. But I always had this idea that she wasn't acceptant of Nanahoshi because Nanahoshi had something special with Rudy. And she was afraid that she would take Rudy from her. And she could never get why the two of them had such a special bond. But here it's kind of pointing it more into the idea that she's just not okay with it just because to her whole established requirements, she doesn't feel Nanahoshi loves Rudy. Now, I would argue against that with the recent happenings 
which, yes, technically, Silphy wouldn't have context to. I felt like that last meeting with Nanahoshi and Rudius after he brings back the, the tea leaves and everything, that I feel like Nanahoshi is is becoming a lot more uh, connected to Rudy. And it, again, like I mentioned at that time, it could be not romantic. It could just be strictly, like she says, this gratitude. But it could be, that's what a lot of that stuff comes from. Why does Silphy love Rudius? The initial meeting was that he saved her and gave her purpose and something to be excited about. And she grew to love him. Same thing with Roxy. Saved her life. She became, you know, in love with him. It always starts with something. There's always a meeting. And sometimes that meeting is gratitude. No, it's not Nanahoshi. Sylphie was relieved, but Rudy looked even more guilty than before. It's a woman named Edis. Roxy spoke up. Isn't that the girl that you were tutoring during your stay in the Fatoa region, Rudy? Yet, Sylphie followed up. Wasn't she the person that caused your condition? Uh, yeah, I guess she was. Sylphie wondered if Rudy was forgetting about how depressed he was before. <laughs> she didn't realize how bad it was until he transformed after their marriage. That's an interesting thing. This idea of like, the assumption that this is, that makes sense because she hadn't seen for Rudy for so long. And then suddenly he pops up in the university and he wasn't like overly outward about his thought process and stuff like that. But he was sort of in this neutral state in outward appearance to a lot of people. And again, taking actions that would sort of show you that he's not in a good mood. But it's something that she didn't realize was affecting him until they got married and his life started getting more positive. He started getting more silly. He started being more open. He started to change. Oh, looking back now, before they were married, he looks much different than he was when he first showed up at the university. That shows how bad he was. It shows that stark contrast there. Sylphie realized that he had been suffering from a serious lack of self-confidence. That condition was no laughing matter to him. It was hard to understand his feelings, but she knew that he'd been suffering. Sylphie spoke up. Do you still love her after all that she did to you? No, not as much as I love you too. That's one thing I can say for sure. Sylphie felt herself blush. He could be such a lady killer if he wanted to. It was hard to suppress squealing a little. If Lydia and Persena were still here, she'd want to brag to them. She snapped herself. <laughs> That's like one of those things of like subconsciously they've left such a, a, a stinker on her. Like they always tease Sylphie. And so it's like, I could have got back at them. <laughs> Sylphie snapped herself back into focus. Okay, so is she the one that wants to make up with you? Even though she dumped you? Well, that's the thing. I might have been wrong about her dumping me. It sounded as if her feelings never really changed at all. Maybe so, but she did break your heart, right? Yeah, that's true. Sylphie didn't have an objection of him having a third wife. She came to terms with that arrangement by now. It wasn't that she didn't want him all to herself, of course, but Rudy wasn't a member of the Mills Church, and she knew that she wasn't strong enough to support him all by herself. That's an interesting um, self-admittance in the idea that she's not, she's not strong enough to do everything. And, I, and that could be partially because Sylphie does technically have a lot of responsibilities on the side that she wants to do, especially with Ariel. But even that idea that it, it can also be, you know, their relationship in the bed as well. And the idea that she's not able to keep up with him sometimes. And so having another person to tap in is nice. But it's still that idea that she knows that Rudius is complicated. I, I think this is me. I believe that she knows that Rudius is complicated. He has all these sides to him. He is a complex person. And so she understands that herself can't keep up with it. There's too many things that I might not be able to feel, which is, yes, putting aside dislike or like of the idea of a harem does technically make sense of that desire to have sort of a team <laughs> to keep him happy. That's how much she wants to keep him happy. If I need to get more people to support him as a team, I'll do it, which is technically something that she's coming to understanding with, with this chapter that I, again, really love. As long as it was someone that loved him and whom he loved, Sylphie wasn't going to object. She made up her mind about that some time ago. However, they were talking about someone who had hurt him deeply in the past. That made things a bit more complicated. You know, Rudy, I still remember how sad and desperate you were. Yeah, back then, I couldn't forgive Addis. Just the idea of seeing her again probably would have terrified me. Sylphie wondered what was so different. Was it because he talked to this blessed child? If you're firmly opposed to the idea, I won't marry her. But at the very least, I think I need to see her and talk things through. Rudy paused and frowned as if something occurred to him. You know, the thing is, Edis has been training in a place called the Source Sanctum for years now. And it sounded like she was doing it for me. Wouldn't it be kind of harsh just to shoot her down when she finally comes back to rejoin me? Well, yeah, I guess it would be. Sylphie could understand that. She put a lot of effort in Buena Village to catch up to Rudy. Cool to see her kind of... <laughs> contrasting herself to Edis' situation. Again, it's it definitely not a one-for-one -one situation here, but at least she can 
yeah, I understand that because this is sort of what I did and it's sort of the same. I'm not really saying that I'm opposed to it or anything. She thought, what if the displacement incident never happened and Rudy never returned to Buena Village? What if she tracked him down only to find that he was married? That would be one heck of a shock. Again, this is kind of the, again, still comparing everybody to the same situation. They all sort of have the same understanding of the situation. That's just like what the whole trip back from, you know, teaching Rudy as King Tear. Is that whole mindset there that Sylphie was giving to Roxy that I just made it back first. I just got to him first. I It sucks the idea that you would be not being able to be with Rudy just because I beat you. It's just, I don't know. I, I've never met this person. That was at the heart of it. Sylphie didn't know Edis. Until this moment, she just thought that she was a cruel person who mistreated Rudy. It sounded like that was a misunderstanding. She hadn't meant to hurt him, right? Roxy then spoke up. Could I interject? It seems to me that we should all defer our decision until we've actually met Edis. You think? Yes. For one thing, I get the impression that you're not entirely sure of your own feelings yet, Rudy. Once you see her again, I'm sure that'll be much easier for you to make up your mind. Sylphie wondered how Roxy felt about this. Last time they discussed adding another wife, she sounded accepting of the idea. Again, that kind of goes back to what <laughs> everybody wants me to say this, I'll say it. Oldius. It goes back to what Oldius <laughs> said about the whole situation that, yeah, bring in Edis. Roxy doesn't even feel like she's worthy of you, so she's gonna be fine with it. <laughs> Which is interesting to say because technically, Oldius didn't have too much extra context to Roxy at that point than what Rudy did. Because again, right after this moment, from his perspective, Roxy pretty much dies shortly after. Roxy continued. And in any case, Sylphie already asked as much of you. Sylphie blinked, unsure of what she meant. <laughs> I was like, I even know what she's talking about. What are you talking about, girl? <laughs> you don't remember, Sylphie? I think your exact words were, just make sure you bring her to meet me first. Bring Edis here and introduce us to her. We'll talk things through and get to know each other. But if things seem like they're just not going to work out, I'll have to oppose the idea as well. The more Sylphie thought about it, it sounded like the most reasonable idea. They weren't committing to anything, but they could just stay open to it. Roxy sure had a good head on her shoulders. Watching her in action made Sylphie feel a little inadequate as a wife. Of course, I imagine that we'll have to discuss the idea with a number of other people as well. But for what it's worth, Rudy, you have my support and trust. Thank you, Roxy. That means a lot. All I ask is that you don't forget about me completely, no matter how many girls you end up marrying. <laughs> She's like, as long as I can be in the picture, <laughs> it's like the, the family photo and you have all the characters together and Roxy's on the side, like, as long as I'm in the frame, I don't really care. It kind of is surprising because that sort of shows that Roxy's sort of in the same mindset as Sylphie. Sylphie over here, seemingly so far as we kind of read here, is this idea that she just wants to make sure that she can support Rudy. Like, I am, it doesn't, I, I, yeah, I want him all to myself, but at the same time, I, I can't support him entirely. And so having more people to support him is a good thing, as long as they love each other, as long as Rudy is happy. Roxy is sort of the same way in the idea that she's accepted of all this stuff, but at the same time, as long as I can be here, I'm fine. <laughs> Rest assured, I couldn't forget about you if I tried. We get a sense of that with the, with the diary. I'll take that as a promise then? Absolutely. Sylphie seen Roxy as clever and thoughtful while Rudy trusted her completely. It made Sylphie feel kind of jealous sometimes. No, that was the wrong way to think about it. She just had to do her best to follow in her footsteps. Sylphie knew that she could be a grown-up too. Just you watch. I love this. I love this. This is such a great little add to the dynamic. Again, I love expanding these characters' minds a bit. And it's so great to kind of see that, honestly, let's be truthful here. And this is, again, going way back to the earlier moments of this series is I always, I was always of the mind of Roxy as being the perfect person for Rudeus, mainly in the idea of age. The idea that technically Roxy is the same age as Rudeus mentally, if you put aside the idea that he was technically a man child for most of his previous life. So putting aside the age thing though, I didn't really feel like Roxy was a good pairing other than that. I felt like she wasn't a, a good person for a relationship because he looked up to her too much. It wasn't a semblance of equality there in their relationship. But yes, I my mind changed over the time, mostly in like volume 12, where you see her falling in love with him. You, you want, obviously, when somebody falls in love with somebody to have that reciprocate in some way, or at least return in some way. But to attach that to this whole conversation here is that the idea that, yes, technically Roxy is much more mature mentally. She's an adult, whereas Sylphie is still a teenager. She doesn't know, she's learning all this stuff. Roxy's learning too how to be a, a wife, but Sylphie is still maturing. She's still growing up. 
And so she sees this relationship in her own way. And you can see that sometimes as being a little bit immature. She's seeing how Roxy's handling it as an adult and wanting to follow that in some way. She's seeing how level-headed Roxy is with the situation and she sort of wants to follow that. Because Roxy is accepting of what Reese is saying, she's going, okay, this is what you're saying. I, I agree there. We'll make sure that we're supporting it right. We're, we're, she's trying to keep the playing field level. She's trying to make sure everything's settled and that Rudius feels like he's being supported. And Sylphie is over here, obviously having those internal conflicts of like, he's doing it again. He's going out there on the battlefield again. He doesn't want to bring me with him. I want to go with him. Why won't he let me go with him? Again, Roxy, okay, we'll handle this. We'll keep things together. And we're going to jump in there whenever it looks bad. Accepting while at the same time, understanding that there is other routes that could come up. Contingencies. So I like seeing Sylphie seeing how Roxy is approaching this from a, what she deems as sort of a mature way of looking at it and wanting to follow in that footstep. Roxy's sort of becoming a role model in a way, which I think is a good thing to accept. I don't have everything figured out. It seems like she's doing a good job here. Maybe I should mimic that a little bit, which again makes sense because Sylphie is still a teenager. She still has room to mature. Does that sound okay, Sylphie? I'm sorry about all this. It's all right. Sorry for being so difficult today. It wasn't really fair of me after all those things I said last time. As they ended up apologizing to each other, for some reason, Sylphie could hear Roxy chuckling softly. <laughs> Sylphie felt that this arrangement was nice. She felt comfortable in this room. It was something that she couldn't get anywhere else, even with Princess Ariel and Luke. But now they might be adding someone to the equation. This made her a little anxious. That's another interesting thought. And the idea that Sylphie, yes, her two like groups basically, over here with Rudy and Roxy. Then over here with Ariel and Luke. We've always seen them, that, that being her two places of comfort and people that she has bonds with. But she's saying that over here specifically, this is nice. I feel comfortable. I feel like I could be myself. But over here, she probably has to focus too much on being fits in a sense. But yeah, I understand the idea that we've established this and it's super comfortable. I wish things could stay this way. Everybody's smiling together. We're supporting each other. I'm relying on Roxy. She's relying on Rudy. Rudy's relying on me. Where it's this triangle. But now we're going to add somebody else to the picture. And I'm afraid that it's going to shake things up. It's going to cause a problem. It's kind of like just in general people's relationship with friends. And the idea that suddenly out of nowhere somebody else shows up. And it's causing a problem in your friendships. That's a <laughs> technically like how so many friendships are kind of broken up, right? This is that idea that suddenly Billy brings in Bob. And Bob is just causing problems. Sophie thought, this girl is not going to steal away Rudy, is she? <laughs> Don't take away my Rudy. <laughs> then we're going to call it all off. <laughs> Cutting over to Rudy's perspective. After the conversation, the three of them slept side by side in his bed. He wasn't quite callous to start a threesome after a heavy discussion. <laughs> Plus, Edis kept popping up in his head, which wasn't great for his emotional state. He thought that he was over all that. But the more he thought about her, the more he could feel the old anxiety and self-doubt bubbling up deep inside of his gut. Just as Roxy pointed out, he wasn't too sure about his feelings with Edis at this point. And everything he knew about her feelings had come secondhand. It's a good point. Either way, he had to settle things between them. Even if the idea of seeing her again was scary, there was gonna be punching involved. It sounded like she had gotten unbelievably strong over the years. There was no telling how she would react to Roxy and Sylphie at his side. That is the biggest concern, is how acceptant she's gonna be that he has somebody else now. Like literally, you, you, in her mind, you're cheating on me. The diary had mentioned her attacking Sylphie, but there was no guarantee how accurate it was. It was hard to tell how it would go. With all this flooding in his mind, it took Rudius a while to fall asleep. That night, the man god paid him a visit. <laughs> it's already, oh my gosh, when I when I seen that line, I was like, because I was like still like a couple lines above and I my like peripheral vision off the side of my vision is that. And I'm like, what? 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 That, that quick? Again, goes back to my joke. Call, 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 call. Rudy answers the phone. Rudy answers the phone. Why won't it go through? <laughs> and it finally goes through. And man, how this starts. This whole conversation, I was right and not so right in a lot of regards, but let's do this. Where he found himself in a familiar pure white space. Again, as a man that he was in his previous life. Reeves recalled his future self's research. How this was a barren world within a cube of six other worlds. How teleportation magic traveled through it, but traveling into it was no easy task. But here he was, standing in the center. What did that mean exactly? Given his old appearance, perhaps it was some sort of summoning magic that only affected your mind or soul. That goes in my theory. 
again, with the whole thing with it, it sort of is attaching a lot of what I've been suspecting and then sort of putting it into his assumed complete form. And the idea of, yeah, you're they're pretty much traveling through it. And the idea that he's in his old self means that his physical body's not going there. That's the key thing. It's probably just his mind. Or the reverse, that he's always just sitting there. That's another theory that's kind of jumped in my head here recently. What if Rius has always just been sitting there? His soul was summoned from another world, and it's been sitting there. And it's sort of remotely controlling a body that is Rudius. And then whenever he goes to sleep, every now and then he'll just kind of wake him up. I need to talk to you for a little bit. Interesting thought. What if one day Rudius finally manages to get inside the barren world and he sees his old self sleeping on the ground? <laughs> oh, that's your soul. <laughs> Again, here's where I deeply regret having such a voice for man god but it works it works in a in a creepy way so i guess it works out in the end the man god was there as always but wait he wasn't smirking <laughs> the man god's mad <laughs> it was hard to tell with the blurriness but given his body language he was in a distinctively bad mood well that's no fun at all yeah okay that sounded like irritation <laughs> had to go and ruin everything the tone of his voice was low and hostile. His usual carefree attitude had disappeared completely. Jumping back in time to warn yourself. Come on, that's not fair. And everything was going so well too. Okay, I get it, you're not happy. Does that mean the old man was telling me the truth? Have you been playing me a fool all this time? Did you kill Roxy and Sylphie? I guess this means his plan worked. Did he just give you a taste of your own medicine? Questions, questions, questions. Always with the questions. Who knows, who cares? It does seem like your future self was laboring under quite a few misconceptions. Just so you know. There you go. Call that one. Call that one. Again, it does technically go in a different direction than I was actually assuming would actually happen. But there it is right there is that idea of like, yes, it's true, but not entirely. And that's probably a lot of the, he's probably more talking about specifically the things with Edis and stuff. Him assuming Edis was working for him and stuff. But he's not denying any of it. <laughs> Well, he's messing with me again, but it doesn't sound like his heart's really in it. I need to keep this conversation going. Oh, he needs to keep the conversation going. Will you stop trying to be some kind of tactician? Haven't you realized you're a moron yet? Okay, two things here. <laughs> Damn, <laughs> man God's mad, <laughs> he's pissed. <laughs> but two, I, when I read this part, I'm like, why is Rudius thinking about something? I've always got the indication that when Rudius is in here, he's speaking through his mind. So the man god's hearing his thoughts. And right here, Ruiz is talking to himself going, ah, oh, man, I, need, I gotta keep the conversation going. And the man god's like, keep the conversation going, whatever. It's like one of those moments, did he realize this, this forgot that he's reading his mind? It's, it's kind of interesting. Which again, goes back to that idea that he's, he's not there physically. He's there mentally. And so he's hearing all these thoughts. Oh, shut up. I might be a moron, but I'm still trying to do my best. On that note, mind tell me something? Why would you do this to me? Why would you try to harm my family? Hmm. Why would I do that? Maybe I just want to kill him so I can watch you freak out about it. Whatever. Wow. He's really half-assing it today. It's almost like he's sulking. He set up some big elaborate trap in a video game, but then someone messed it all up, wandered off the wrong direction, and now he doesn't want to even play anymore. Kind of, yeah, it, it does kind of throw this kind of juvenile sense to the man god, which is kind of interesting. Yeah, more or less. You messed it all up. You stupid, thoughtless jerk. Again, it sounds so juvenile. <laughs> it sounds so juvenile. Ugh. Can you just tell me what's going on here? I don't really care what your ultimate goal is. I'm really not interested in getting in your way. My future self told me I can't kill you anyways. He told me to suck it up and not defy you. And I'm fine with that, personally. I mean, things were fine between us up until now. Even if you were just setting me up to betray me, you still help me out plenty of times. You can use me if you want to. It's not like I have any reason to disobey you. All I'm asking is that you don't go after my family. Well... Aren't you accommodating? I mean, whatever you did to that old man, you haven't managed to harm me yet. As far as I know, at least. You did try to kill Roxy and her baby, but she came out unscathed. Since she's okay, I think I can pretend that never happened. I can still control my emotions. I want to find some way to coexist with you before things cross the point of no return. Hmm. The man got paused for a moment, apparently considering something that hadn't occurred to him yet. Hey, let me pause here. <laughs> I'm going to get way too out of myself here. It is very interesting that this is Rudius's laying down the law. This was this was his plan. This idea that, okay, he's mad. <laughs> but 
and I can't defy him, so let's just work together. It sort of bugs me later on, and this could change when we get to the next chapter, because I haven't read beyond this chapter. It sort of does bug me the idea that Rudius is... Yes, he's not going against the Man God, but at the same time, he's sort of trying to play into the Man God in a way that is probably not going to work out for him. <laughs> so I wonder just how much Rudius is accepting what he's saying here. But it's true. Rudius is true here. If I can't beat him, if I don't want to actively go against him, I can't avoid him. So at least I can go, just tell me what I can do for us just to work together. Just don't try to kill my family. <laughs> like you're going to stop. Like, as we find out here in a minute, like, he would stop. What if I told you my goal is world peace? Would you believe that? World peace, huh? Sounds great. I'm on board. Love and peace is my personal motto. Nothing better than tranquil days spent rolling around in bed, am I right? Let's put the sex thing aside for now. Sure thing. You remember that dragon god guy? Your old buddy, Orsted? Well, his ultimate goal is to destroy the world. Wait, really? I wasn't getting that vibe from him, honestly. He's been sulking around in the shadows for a long time, making all sorts of evil plans. Here's the thing. If I die, the world will break apart into a million pieces and fade away completely. So Orsted is looking for a way to murder me. I don't trust anything anymore. I think it's a lie. It, he technically did elude to that before. In a previous discussion, yes, he did bring up this idea that the Orsted has, is the most powerful. He just has something preventing him from using all of his power. And he could destroy the world. I think even back then he said he wants to destroy the world. So this isn't something new. This is something that the man god has stated before. And so this is consistent from what he's been saying. But I felt that was a reason to make Rudy not trust Orsted. Even back then, don't go near him. Don't go near him. But yes, this chapter is making me believe that back then, it wasn't to meet Nanahoshi. It was to get Rudius killed by Orsted. You're two going to work together, so let's just have him kill you now. You sure you didn't do something horrible and piss him off? Again, that goes to my theory. The idea, yes, I think back in the, a while back, he probably manipulated Orsted. I don't know, maybe get his family killed for no apparent reason? Which again, Rudius is connecting here. <laughs> like, yes, you probably did the same thing you did to my future self. Don't you remember what I told you earlier? I can't do anything to Orsted. As far as I know, he has no reason to hate me. Well, okay then. Go on. Orsted is very powerful, but he's also alone. His curse keeps it that way. And so long as he's isolated, he'll never be able to harm me. Which makes me believe that there's a possibility that the man god put that curse on Orsted. That's probably another reason why Orsted hates him so much. Why don't you just ignore him then? That was the plan until you appeared. What do I have to do with anything? Well, you're not the problem exactly. But it seems like your descendants are immune to the effects of Orsted's curse. At some point in the future, those descendants are going to join forces with him. And together, they're going to kill me. Which technically puts it in line with what Orsted said to Edis. And the idea that we're eventually going to meet. And maybe that eventual meet is meeting you, or not necessarily meeting her, but meeting her children. Oh, I get it. So that's why you went after Roxy when she got pregnant. The old man thought that you were manipulating Luke into dragging Sylphie off too, did I? But he didn't say anything about you targeting Lucy. So I'm sticking on that point right there. I guess it's my second or third kid that's going to be the problem, huh? Wait. Couldn't you have just killed me off years ago or something? Why would you let things come this far? So many questions that are technically going against him. Well, when I first noticed you during the displacement incident. <laughs> Gosh, there's so many like little, little comments that I'm like, wait. <laughs> like, th here's overall, my frustration with this chapter is the idea that I, my mind has thought of a million theories during the time of reading this. And it's like, then it, there's so many theories popping in my head that I can't make, I can't focus on one individual one. And I could probably make a whole video just running down 50 rabbit holes. But yes, why the displacement incident? Why the displacement incident? Makes me believe the man god was involved with the displacement incident, which does technically go against my theory and the idea that I bl believe that the man god was using Rudeus or somebody was using Rudeus um, to build up mana and bring it there to trigger the displacement incident. This at least possibly takes the man god out of the picture in that situation. That it wasn't until a displacement incident that he actually noticed him. Again, that's counter to the idea that originally summoned to the barren world as his soul, and he's been controlling this physical self. I did try a few things to see what would happen. I'm afraid that you got a very strong destiny, though. It never worked out the way I wanted it to. A strong destiny? What does it even mean? Hmm, how can I explain? I can see a number of broad routes the future might follow branching out ahead of me, 
that goes to my theory and the idea that he's like a basically like a physical like an an entire self of a eye of foresight and the idea that he is seeing a future but it branches just like the eye of foresight does and i can tamper with the course of the events to some degree but when i try to manipulate the events involving people with strong destinies it rarely works out in the end you survived the fight with orsted for example there it is confirmed <laughs> confirmed he legit sent rudius to orsted to try to see if Orsted would kill him. And he survived. Because none of Hoshi was there. But I'm wondering what that if that's a part of that strong destiny. Which makes me wonder why he never got... Um, I guess technically the point here is that Rudius's descendants are going to come kill him. And that possibly means that none of Hoshi's not involved. Because you would assume, because none of Hoshi's not afraid of Orsted too. That she wouldn't be... Uh, would, that she would be a target. But that also implies this idea that she never has children. And even though I tried to keep you as far away from Roxy, you end up finding her, marrying her, and having a kid. Again, last time he said that, no, she ha she was fated here. She's going to be elsewhere. Uh, nope. <laughs> you were supposed to meet her. Again, he was lying. Oh, is this a principle of casualty thing? Like when you travel to the past and rewrite history, but things just end up working out the same exact way? Something like that, I guess. Huh. Okay. So Roxy and I were destined to get married then. That makes me kind of happy. Can't say I feel the same. Sure, right, sorry. But anyways, why did you decide to go after my kids in particular? I mean, these descendants we're talking about were like a few generations later, I'm assuming. Couldn't you just deal with them when they joined forces with the Orsted? That's like kicking the can down the road. It's like, why kill them now? Just let them, let them be born and let me be happy. And then when I pass away, then you can deal with them. <laughs> That's so mean. The ones directly responsible for my death will also be born with extremely strong destinies. It's not just you, by the way. Sylphie, Edis, and Roxy's are strong as well. And your kids will also be on the stronger side. That said, women have times in their lives where their destiny gets a little... vague. Huh? Wait, do you mean... That's right. It's when they have a child inside of them. He purposely went after Rox. It's, it's not just a, a case of the petrification syndrome that affects women that are pregnant. It's like a double thing with Roxy. Destiny was the most vulnerable. And that petrification syndrome works really nice. Rudius had the urge to punch him, but he knew that he couldn't possibly beat him in this form or in this place. Of course, I still managed to fail somehow. Why'd you bother murdering Sylphie then? She wasn't pregnant at the time, and she'd already given me a daughter. What? Are you talking about the diary now? Hard to comment, but I suppose I was trying to play it safe. On the other hand, Maybe it was Sylphie's destiny to die if she left you at that point. I guess it is possible. God, that's depressing. That's cool. That, that, or that, not cool. It's interesting that the man god right here is admitting that I've, that wasn't part of my plan. I, I, I guess, yes, I probably did that, but that wasn't in my plans the moment. Like I'm, I'm just right here. Oh, Roxy's going to do this. Time to take her out. I'm not, he's not even at that point yet. Not thinking that far ahead yet. You know, I really did think my plan was perfect. Once I realized your destiny was strong, I took things nice and slow. I guided you along, step by step, all so that I could strike the most efficient way at your most vulnerable moment. Is he trying to piss me off now? Ugh, calm down. Don't try to let him get to you. Roxy and Sylphie are both just fine. It's all good. I'm not sure why you're trying so hard to convince yourself of that. Again, it's like Reese is thinking in his mind and he just picks up on it. It's really interesting. You don't think you've won, do you? Just so you know, your children's destinies won't be as strong as yours, your wives, or your descendants. I'm not planning to give up either. I really would prefer not to die. Well, yeah, I guess you wouldn't. Isn't there some other way that we can approach this, though? I'm willing to do anything to save my family. Maybe I could start a family tradition of teaching the new generation not to trust Orsted. We could tell our kids about how wonderful the man god is, and how evil the nasty dragon god is. Sorry, won't work. Destiny isn't easy to derail. Can you think of it a little harder, please? I have a pretty strong destiny myself, right? There has to be something I can do. Oh. What? Did you think of something? You're playing into his hand, Rudius. You're playing into his hand, Rudius. <laughs> right into his hands. Well, I'm not sure if it's even possible, but there's certainly a chance that it could work. Hmm. You did say you'd do anything, right? Uh, yeah. Okay, then. Pausing for a moment. The man god grinned at him. Like a mischievous 
child. There's so much emphasis on the child thing, by the way. <laughs> Go kill Orsted for me. <laughs> oh, there it is. I've been waiting for it. I've been waiting for it. My gosh. Finally. Finally, he says it. Finally, he just says it. Rudy woke up, Sylphie calling out to him. He was squeezing her tightly, his throat dry and body cold. He released her, coughing for air. His forehead was covered in sweat. Roxy inquired if he was okay, having her arms wrapped around him from behind. He assured the two of them it was okay, as he tried to grasp whether it was a dream or not. But no doubt, it was the man god. Go, kill, Orsted for me. Was he serious? What was he playing out here? He had to calm down and think it through. Orsted was an open enemy of the man god, no question about it. However, Orsted was isolated. He couldn't beat the man god on his own. That seemed to be an absolute certainty. It was hard to imagine that someone as powerful as him would need help, but it was just the way that things were. At some point in the future, Rhys's descendants would become Orsted's allies. So the man god tried to prevent that, killing Roxy and Sylphie, keeping him from having children. Without his family in the picture, Orsted would never make it to the barren world, and the man god would be victorious by default. Today, the man god realized he couldn't eliminate his family. They had to be why he ordered him to kill Orsted. Both Orsted and his descendants had to be alive in order to defeat him. As long as one or the other was out of the picture, the man god would be safe. Question was, if he could defeat Orsted, from the sound of things, Rudy's destiny was very strong. Surely that applied to Orsted too. He's already picking on this destiny thing. Like you, you talk about this destiny thing and it's probably the same case with Orsted too. After all, he was still alive, despite waging a war against the man god for many years. How was he supposed to kill Orsted? He was unbelievably powerful. The diary contains some things that his future self used in battle. Maybe he can make his own version of that magic armor. It didn't seem impossible and he felt that it could be extremely effective in combat. His future self also had different types of magic and stuff. Sadly, he failed to mention how he mastered them. Yeah, that's a problem. It's like, yeah, he had gravity and everything, but he never said how he did it. Again, he didn't know that he was gonna have to read it. He did manage to harm Orsted last time and his electric worked really well in Etoff. So he had ways of hurting him. He just had to survive long enough to use them. Damn it. This is Orsted we're talking about. Why is he even taking this seriously? <laughs> this is the point where I'm like, uh, Rudy, chill, wait. <laughs> Rudy, please tell me if there's something wrong. Don't keep it bottled up inside. Sylphie looked at him like she was about to cry. He pulled her to his chest and touched Roxy who's behind him. He had to keep them safe. That's why. I understand that part of it. Yes, technically it's like aspect of like, it's technically the Orsted, technically Man God gave him an alternative. I'm gonna kill your family unless you kill this person. He's technically keeping his entire family hostage and saying, go take out that target or I'll kill them. It looks like I'm gonna have to kill someone. What? Rudy, what are you talking about? He apologized to them and left him behind and headed to his study. His head was swimming, his steps unsteady. He had to check the diary to find out how the old man fought his battles. He was going to kill Orsted. It was the only way to protect his family. He'd do that one way or another, even if it cost him his life. In his study, he found a letter that he was gonna mail out the next day if everything went well. Scratching a few lines off the very bottom, he thought, maybe I wouldn't get to see Edis again after all. I wish it actually said what he wrote because what are those few lines at the bottom? We can get married or something? Um, what is at the bottom of it? Let's get together, let's have a happy life, yada, yada, yada. Curious. That is chapter three. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, again, like I said earlier, my head was swimming with theories here. Um, I'm still, I still don't trust the, okay, let me, let me go with one of my, I've been keeping a document with some crazy theories in it. I, I have a document of Andrew's crazy Mushoku Tensei theories that I never really share with anybody. Um, I mean, there's, there's a few people I've shared a couple of them with, but I don't necessarily want to bring them on here because they're theories that I think are so outlandish that I don't want even a peep from people. I don't want people to even say, hmm, maybe, or what the hell, where'd you get that? Because it, it confirms or denies it. I don't trust people. <laughs> In my crazy theories area, one is that Orsted is the original dragon god that was essentially destroying all the worlds. And this, this kind of plays into that. This idea that Orsted the Dragon God is trying to destroy the worlds. And they went from world to world, destroying each one of them. And now they're trying to get to the barren world to destroy everything. And that plays into what the man God's saying here. The Dragon God Orsted is evil. They're trying to destroy the world. And he's trying to get to me. And if I die, the world's 
collapse. Everything collapses. I'm keeping it together as the center point of the, the six-sided worlds. In this barren world, I'm holding everything together. And if he gets in here, he's going to kill me. It goes back to that whole, like story of the history and everything like that, and this is like a long thing that I hope I can kind of describe this all correctly, is that, yes, what if way back here, when the Dragon World was still there, Dragon God, being Orsted, or maybe in a reincarnation of the Dragon God, is Orsted, this original Dragon God was deceived by the Man God, or maybe thought that the world was being destroyed by the Man God, and wanted to get to the Man God and kill him. These Dragon... These dragon folk, the dragon kin, th th this is all they do is research this stuff. They've been trying to figure out how to get to the man god. You think all these individuals were trying to figure out how to get there just to kill the man god and destroy the world? I mean, there's also the possibility that Orsted wrote all that stuff. Maybe all the murals was wrote by Orsted. Or there's a possibility that Orsted has been trying to do what they've been trying to do this whole time. Get to the man god and destroy them. Because there's a possibility this whole revisionist history crap that we keep running into... What the man god's been one by one knocking off all of these worlds. And the dragon god and the dragon kin have been trying to get to him to stop him. And this is where they're at right now. That's why Ors is going around everywhere trying to figure out, maybe trying to find the other dragon general in order to get that last piece to get to the, the man god. That's a, that's a possibility. Why is Orsted wandering everywhere? Just aimlessly? No. They might be trying to find the general. I have nothing else I want to do right now. I just want to find this general so I can get that last piece and get to the man god. And I think that's because they felt the man god was a threat. This is a whole thing where it's like that opposite. Oh, no, I'm not trying to destroy the world. He is. Don't look at me. He's the one doing it. And the dragon, the dragon god's over here going, no, he's, he's trying to destroy the world. Like, what else? What other reason would Orsted, the dragon god, be so hatred towards Rudius the moment that he hears the man god they're adversaries obviously but no you're another person that's going to try to destroy the world gotta get rid of you you're a threat to this world gotta get rid of you why isn't Orsted going around destroying if Orsted's goal is to destroy the world why isn't he going around just nuking everything Let, let's think about this Orsted isn't destroying everything man god is trying to destroy Rudius there's a lot more. There's a lot more animosity over here than there is over here right now. Um, I'm convinced that Orsted is going to be a positive, and the Man God is still manipulating Rudius. And I and it, it bugs me right here because Rudius is accepting this. It's not that he trusts the Man God, but he's at least going. I will play the middle ground. As long as I can keep my family, I'll destroy anything else. And that's a. <laughs> On one end, a very terrible person to be thinking that way. It's like the whole idea of like, um, I mean, that is in general the idea of like, if somebody were to take your family member hostage and say, if you don't go over here and take out this person, I'm going to take them out. It is that conundrum there of like, I can't keep them safe because they're forcing my hand. And so I have to bloody my hands just to keep my family safe, even though that my family probably wouldn't be okay with that. Um, but I guess there is an idea of thinking, well, yeah, if, if it's true that the dragon god is evil and is trying to destroy the world, I sure I'll help them. But that's that oddity there. Think about this, Rudius. Why would your descendants join Orsted to kill the man god when that would destroy the worlds? Maybe because it's not going to destroy the worlds. Maybe at some point they join up with him. Yeah, there could be an, as an aspect that the dragon god Orsted uh, deceives them all into joining him and then goes to destroy the man god and the worlds collapse. But I think there is an element there that they're, they probably figured it out, Rudius. <laughs> they probably figured it out. But again, it goes back to the idea of like, but does Rudius have a choice here? His hand is being forced. Uh, yet all the destiny stuff is really interesting to learn about. And I think that's an element of like, yeah, it could be a predestination thing. Like you can't sway from this path. It has to go this route, which just like, technically makes sense. The idea of like the eye of foresight. That there's these branching routes, these possibilities, and this one right here is the seemingly the one that's going to happen. And you could try to sway it to go this direction, but no, it just kind of, nope, it goes back in line. It gets right back in line. It's going to go this route. And it's interesting to, for him to kind of point out there's all these possibilities, and those that have, that are destined, to have this destination, they're, they're more likely that it's going to keep it in that route. 
very curious for him to point out the idea that when it comes to women and bearing children, their destinies become very questionable. And I think that's a lot to do with the idea of how precious childbirth is. There is a lot of possibilities in the birth of a child. There's so there it's fragile. It's a frag, It's a very fragile process, and one simple thing can go wrong. I mean, that's just like Norn and the idea of a breech birth. It's like just one turn of the child, and suddenly lives are at stake. And yes, again, like I said earlier, a child is very fragile, and a woman. It, it's a. It takes a. It's a. It's a massive strain to a woman. There's so many things that can put them in a bad state. And yeah, you could probably equate that to the idea of the petrification syndrome. It's something that seemingly targets that. But yeah, the Destiny's Things is really, really interesting. Oh, what else? Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's just a... Uh... Um, but no, it was funny because when I when I went to go grab the next chapter to put it in my document, I read the Nanahoshi title and I was like, oh yeah, I, that would be a good person to talk to right now. I haven't read it yet, but the moment I see Nanahoshi, I'm like, yeah, I... I don't know that Ors is like was always talking to Nanahoshi about everything, but yeah, there's a good chance that he told Nanahoshi something, or at least revealed why he's traveling the world. What's the purpose of him again wandering around? Again, he's probably looking for the general. She just dawned on me. I wonder the reason why Rudius never, the future Rudius never seen Orsted. Is I wonder if Edis actually killed him. <laughs> I don't think so because it kind of implied this idea that Edis was always following Rudius around, but there could have been a time where. As she was following him around, she eventually seen Orsted. But again, I think it's probably more of an idea that Orsted's just traveling around trying to find a way to, uh, trying to find the general. And so they're never going to cross paths because Reese was just over here. At some point he started traveling around and he never ran into him, but yeah. But yeah, my path right here would probably be to check with Nanahoshi first. Try to find out what she knows about Orsted. I, I think before she's kind of not really implied too much. Um, and that might be, that might change a bit now that he might reveal to her that, yeah, I, I have this reason for why I might need to kill Orsted. Let me know what kind of person he is. But there is a side of me that would almost wish to push this forward. <laughs> like I, I there, granted, it's not like Rudius really trusts Orsted in any way or would, would be not fearful the idea of confronting Orsted. But there is a side of me that's like, let's, let's go talk to Orsted, get his side of the story first. <laughs> Before we plan too much, and that might be ultimately what he does. He might go to try to find Orsted and go, yeah, um, can we talk? Please don't try to kill me. Can we just talk? And yeah, find out from Orsted what his plans are. Because it's not as if Orsted has ever deceived him, but it can. it's not like they sat down and have a conversation. There's a, there, there's a chance that there could be a conversation there. But yeah, I, I'm still sticking on the whole thing about I... I didn't, he didn't notice Rudius until the displacement incident, which again, I think that's because I think the man God at least was there and seeing what was going on, or at least observed it, but there's a good chance that he possibly caused it, which makes me wonder if there's a possibility that he created the displacement incident to bring in Nanahoshi. Rudius got sucked into the whole situation. He then notices Rudius, which again, this goes back to my whole theory of the idea of time differences in Rudius's transfer to the location. And thus, one appeared before the other physically in that world. And then it all culminates to the displacement incident itself. Again, I also have the theory, the idea that the, the displacement incident could be time travel. Um, I, can, I have so many theories popping in my head right now, I can't keep it straight. But it's curious for him to claim that he hasn't, he didn't notice Rius until that moment. Which technically plays into the idea of what is this whole wavelength thing that the man god has talked about before. Because he claimed that he can't talk to anybody. The person has to be some sort of wavelength. And that kind of plays into sort of the discussions that have been had before with um, Future Rudius and the idea that the man god isn't man god. It's just a name that he's been giving people. That he's this god of men. Which imply this idea that this god that came from another world. And yes, the, the, the obvious theory there is that there's a possibility it's a god from our world that possibly came here at some point was messing around with things in this six-sided world and again plays into my theory the idea of the man god possibly have been destroying the worlds themselves and then now the dragon god wants to kill him for it but possibly why Rius is this wavelength is because he's a human from our world which could possibly be where the man god came from somebody that he can converse with and yes when the displacement incident happened he goes oh, there's somebody i can talk to 
there's somebody that I can communicate with. And why would he possibly see it then? Again, the displacement incident was sort of portrayed in this idea that he was flying above the horizon, but he could have possibly went through the barren world briefly and the man god seen him and said, oh, <laughs> you look familiar. You look like somebody I can talk to. Um, that is very interesting because again, technically what happens when Ruiz, right when he arrives there, he says that he's plummeting and he's trying to find somewhere where he can safely land, but he may have just barely tipped into the barren world and that's when he grabbed him. I can use you. Thanks for, thanks for peeking in my neighborhood here in the barren world. Come on over here and sit down and have some tea. I could, we can, we could talk. Um, it's very, very fascinating in that regard. But it's kind of curious to think that that would be like the moment where he's like, crap, this person, I see his future and it doesn't look good for me. Like Re the Space Bay incident happened, Rius tips through the barren world. He grabs him, sees into his future and says, oh, this dude's going to kill me. Time to take action. Which again, makes me wonder what he was doing with the whole displacement incident if he was involved with it. Again, there's a... <laughs> I can't keep my theory straight right now. This sucks. I'm going all over the place. I don't know. Maybe the next Mystical Monday is going to be me talking about these theories. I don't know. Um, I just might throw them in a document and just kind of move on as we go along because I don't want to sit here and spend too much time just throwing down different dumb theories. Anyways, I, I think I'm going to stop. <laughs> I think I'm going to stop. I don't know. We'll see as I go along. I might run into certain points and go, yeah, I was thinking about that. I was thinking about that. It's a lot of fun. It, this is a, this is a very interesting little bit here. Again, kind of, kind of seeing this coming. I, I was kind of assuming eventually we're going to get to that point where it's like, kill, just, just kill him. But I didn't really think Rudius would be kind of latching onto it this hard. And I'm very curious to see what this next chapter kind of unfolds for it. But yeah, super excited for what's to come. But uh, that is that is it. I hope you guys enjoyed this Mashuka Monday. Thanks to you guys so much for everybody that dropped by for the premiere. Hey, chat. Hope you guys are doing well. Thanks so much for everybody for their support, for kind words, all those that support monetarily through memberships, Patreon supporters. I greatly, greatly, greatly appreciate you guys. are That means so much to me. You guys are so amazing. Uh, but yes, uh, till the next <laughs> Mashuka Mondays, you all take care. In his, in his study, he found a letter. In his study, he found a letter he planned to mail out the next day if it went well. Maybe he could maybe he could make his own version of that magic ardor. Maybe he could make his own version of that. Maybe he could make his own version of that magic. How's Norn? How's Norn acquitting? How's Norn acquitting herself to her luck? How's Norn acquitting herself to school? How's her, how's Norn? How's I don't know. Maybe you've been a more peckish. Maybe you've been a bit. Maybe you've been getting more peckish a lot. What a bunch of hopeless ignorance. It's good to know that I'll have you and watch my back. Bring Edis here and introduce us to bring Edis here and introduce her. Bring Edis here and introduce her to his bring Edis here and introduce her to his bring Edis here and introduce her to us. But if things don't seem to be going but thing but if things don't seem like they're just going but if things just but if things but if things seem like they're just not gonna work Roxy sure had a good idea. Rest assured, I couldn't I could rest assured I it doesn't seem like your future self was laboring under quite a it does seem like your future self was laboring under some quite. It seem. It does seem like your future self was laboring under some. It does seem like your future self was laboring under. Will you stop pretending to be some court? Will you stop? Will you stop pretending to be some sort of? Will you stop? To, I can see a number of broad roads. I can see a number of broad road. I can see a number of broad routes. I can see a. I can see a number of broad routes.